And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Chatting with Nuts. This marks episode, I believe, 17, uh, which is wild that I'm still doing this. Um, and you guys still tune in, which is wild. I can actually hear myself here. Okay, there. Got it muted. Uh, as you can see, new camera. Um, I'm trying a little bit of a different setup. I hope it looks okay. Um, this is direct, uh, directly because of all my patrons, so I do appreciate them. And um, pretty much all that money is going to go into channel upgrades and whatnot, so... I am excited about that, and I do want to thank everyone uh, over there on Patreon. Everyone here tonight, and tonight's guest for the 17th episode is um, a good friend of mine who makes some wonderful content um, over on her channel, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Joanna from the channel Joanna, and yeah, I have a booktube channel that's mostly focused on fantasy. Uh, I do read other genres as well, including sci-fi. Uh, but I have mostly just focused on fantasy so far on my channel, and I'm having a great time. I'm so excited to be here. Jimmy, thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's it's my pleasure, and uh, I knew I wanted to have you on. It's just uh, one of those things where I had to work out schedule-wise, and it did finally. And I love your setup, by the way. You have oh. a, a wonderful, you have, you have your light walls, your dark door, <laughs> very aesthetic shelf, and the lighting, very good. Very oh, good. thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm working on it because I just moved. Uh, my husband and I just moved into a house. We just bought a house. So he's actually been trying to help me with like plants and things like that and trying to make it a little more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Buying a house. That's a, that's a big move. That's something I'm hoping to do in the next year or so. Um, and hopefully I can have a more aesthetic looking. I mean, I do okay here, you know, but I can't, I have one at floating shelves and type of things. I like to kind of show off uh, all these books that I shouldn't have bought that I did. Um, <laughs> but that, that'll be for me. Well, congratulations on buying a house. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's been wonderful so far. Uh, it's been a little dramatic for my pets, I think my dog and cat, but otherwise it's been great to be a homeowner for sure. Yeah, I have a, I have two cats and they definitely struggled whenever we moved into this house. Um, one brave doesn't care, just sniffing around. The other one crying, wailing. You know, I want to go back to the old one bedroom apartment. What are we doing in the town home? They didn't understand the concept of stairs or anything like that. Yeah. So, are they both indoor? Yeah, yeah, uh, they should be. Sometimes they get out, uh, which is always a uh, traumatic experience for me. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, both of my cats, well, my cat is indoor outdoor. Well, he was when we lived in our apartment and he was kind of like the master of the apartment complex. And uh, once we moved here, we kept him indoors for the first week just to make sure he wouldn't run away. And he wouldn't let us sleep that first week, which we knew he wouldn't. <laughs> and, then, and then little by little, we tried to trust him to go outdoors. And it seemed to work for a week. And then he was lost for two weeks. So we went through a very dramatic two weeks. And then he finally, some neighbors found him. So now he's back. He has an injured paw. And it's just been crazy. <laughs> My so goodness. Like yeah, it's been wild. And well, I'm glad he's home. And I'm glad that uh, he's in the healing process, at least. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's been crazy. So, I mean, um, I, I see you have some books behind you. Uh, are you a, are you a big physical book, book person? Like, do you have a ton? Okay, so not really. Um, I have been more of like a book minimalist for a long time. And there are various reasons for that. One, okay, I guess I can go back further with this. So uh, I come from a music background. And when I was younger, I was really into opera, like watching operas, not so much singing in them, although I've sung in the choir of a few operas. And back then I was obsessed with collecting opera DVDs. And so I, I, that's what I would, I would buy constantly buy opera DVDs and I would invite friends over and we'd watch operas together and critique the singers and the performance. And so that was like a big hobby of mine. Okay. And then after a while, I guess friends kind of move away and things like that. And I started realizing I had all these opera DVDs and nobody to watch opera with. And I just started to feel kind of like isolated in that activity and just, I still have a bunch of those DVDs, but I just realized like, I don't think I need to be a collector of these things. Like I, I just, uh, I can appreciate these things. I realized it was more about the connection and yes. connecting to other people than it was about owning the DVDs. And for whatever reason, that sort of idea sort of bled into how I felt about books. And so I ended up like giving up a bunch of books that I owned at the time, some of which I regret giving up. 
And I, <laughs> and then over the years, I've been in and out of reading for fun, but I've tried to utilize the library as much as possible. And because I realized like collecting books, even that was more about like connecting to other people, like having a conversation piece with other people. And now I'm realizing there's, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And that could be really cool. But another part of that was also moving a lot and wanting to make sure that I had my roots really settled in to where I was going to be staying in the country and buying a house. And so now that I'm more settled in, I do want to consciously start buying books, but I want to be really careful and purposeful about it. So I have a very, as you can see, I'm backwards. I have a very small collection behind me. I will probably at some point do like a tiny bookshelf tour. Uh, but I, yeah, I do want to build my collection. And so right now I'm actually working on the trade paperbacks of Malaz and Book of the Fallen, which by the way, I know you're reading. Uh, yes. Are you collecting those by the way? I, I actually already have all 10. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> so I got really lucky with the Malaz and trade paperbacks, which I think, mm -hmm. I honestly think as a series, I think it has the best covers. Yes. And I also think, uh, and I was actually, uh, I'm hoping to bring this up on another episode. <clears throat> I think the titles of the books are the best titles of any fantasy series. Yes. Um, Definitely. like when you just go down the spines, you're just like, man, those names are so sick. Um, I got them in a lot off of eBay. Obviously they're not all matching or anything like that, but they are all trade paperback. Some are Bantam, some are tour. Um, and most of them in are almost like new condition, except for my memories of ice is, is pretty beat up. Um, but it's a huge book, so I understand why. So, yeah, I got a whole lot off eBay for a really good deal. This is after I read book one. And I said, eh, let's do it, I guess. And I gambled. And I'm glad I did because I'm having a great so time. With this smart, book. So smart because it's getting, it feels like a rena the Laws and Book of the Fallen is going through a renaissance period right now. And they're so hard to find, like those trade paperbacks. Yeah, they are. Yeah. The Memories of Ice edition especially that is like a gold mine right now. If you have the one with the rental, I think on the cover, <laughs> I have um, a, a bunch of uh, people charging into a castle siege with fire sticks above their head. It's the band. That's the one I have. I yeah. have that one. Actually, mm -hmm. I actually love that version. I don't think there's a bad version of that book though. Um, yeah. I think they're all pretty good looking. I agree. I agree. Cause yeah, there are two different kind of trade paperback versions of the series and they're all gorgeous. They're yeah, all amazing. Yeah. And mine are also mixed. They're all kind of different. But yeah, I'm trying to collect all of those. I still need to get the Crippled God. And I don't have a Gardens of the Moon trade paperback because I guess I'm a little sentimental about my pretty beat up mass market paperback <laughs> that I started the series with. So well, I actually have a Gardens of the Moon trade paperback. I have an extra copy if you want it. Uh, it has a the back cover's a little bent, but if you would like it, I would definitely send it to you. Are you serious? Oh, yeah, why not? I won't say no to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wow. back here. So I have like an extra pile of books that don't fit on my shelves or the duplicates. And uh, that's one of the ones I have. So that is so generous of you. Thank yeah, of course. You. Yeah. Whenever we're done, uh, I'll get your address and I'll, I can ship it to you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, of course. No problem. Because uh, I was actually going to donate it anyways. So this is perfect. Helping out a friend. This is good. Um so I don't keep spending hundred first covers. Loki hoping I don't like Malazan, so I don't end up spending hundreds of <laughs> on first edition hardcovers. They're so expensive. We got yeah. some from Portugal in the chat. Hey, oh, nice. what's up, mate? Oh. Single mm -hmm. ebook. Yeah, you know the thing about Malazan. Um, <laughs> Rhythm says no, just docs Joanna on stream. <laughs> I mean, that's about that was my plan all along, actually. What's up, Steve? He says, hello, friends. Always enjoy hearing uh, Joanna chat. Wait, oh, you don't you don't enjoy me I chat? Just, what, what, what is it? It's just the best thing to chat. I just love talking about that series. I, I just get so excited. I, I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I'm so thrilled that you're enjoying it. I thoroughly loved your discussion with Philip the other night. Fantastic. Yeah, that went rather well um, on all fronts, to be honest. Also, Alan says he's in the car on the way out of town. Aww. Alan, I hope you're coming Yay. to see me. Yay. Uh, you said you'd be up a good here. Trip. Be safe. Oh, man. Uh, I'll just be happy with my subterranean <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, if only, right? If only. Um, I hope Jimmy brings up Dune at some point. Yeah, we, we can we, we'll oh, definitely yeah, talk, we can talk about, about that too. Yeah. 
Chat is busy tonight. Yeah, so I did the chat with uh, Philip this past Wednesday for House of Chains, which I see you have set up, I believe. Is that what's set up behind you? It is. It, okay. it doesn't. I have a really junky old bookshelf, and it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, you know, the mass made, the, sorry, the trade paperbacks, they're slightly different heights, and yes. that one doesn't fit on the shelf with the other <laughs> I had the one. same issue with some of my Stephen King books. I have like a Stephen King shelf because I have like 28 of his books and uh, some of the hardbacks don't fit on the shelf I bought for it. And I'm like, yeah, so I lay them down or, or I display them like you up on top and I, I flip them outward. Um, yeah, the House of Chains thing went really well. One, I thought the conversation was excellent. Um, we had Steven Erickson in the chat correcting my pronunciations, which I, I thought like in a good way, like he wasn't being mean or anything. It, yeah. was excellent. it was excellent. And um just overall, I was surprised with the turnout. Uh, you know, usually on a weeknight for a spoiler chat. I'm not counting on like a chatting with nuts size crowd, but we had about this many people uh, at one point, and it's really, really impressive. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that book and that book is fantastic. The talk small the book. Yeah, yeah, we had two wonderful discussions uh, on the female perspective in Malaz and Book of the Fallen. One of those videos is on my channel. And one is on Ola, the Reading Witches channel. Fantastic time discussing the series from that perspective. And Rhythm says reading 28 Stephen King books might kill her. <laughs> Don't worry, Rid. I got you. I'll read them all. Don't have worry. Have you read? How many have you read? Uh, not not that many. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I have a, a multiple copies of, of Dark Tower books because uh, I collect first editions. I also have the original trade paperback of The Gunslinger. Um, and then I have another reprint of The I think I have four copies of The Gunslinger. Uh, I'm just a really big fan, especially the Michael Whalen art. Um, I would go get it if I wasn't so lazy. Uh, but the Michael Whalen art for the Dark Tower is one of the best book covers ever, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so I have a lot of duplicates, but I would say I've probably read about maybe not quite half, maybe 10. No, with with Dark Tower. No, I've probably read over half of them, actually. It's probably more mm. like I think I've read like 16 or 17 Stephen King books because um, Dark Tower obviously is eight of those, which is nice. So. That's cool. Yeah, I've only read the first three Dark Tower books. I need to continue on. I've been really eager to. I've just been uh, putting it on the back burner because of trying to read Malaz and Book of the Fallen and finish that series this year. And then I read 11, 22, 63. So those are the only King books I've read. But I come from a family. I feel like I come from a family of King lovers. And I was visiting my family last weekend for a wedding. And it was funny because I was interviewing all of them about their favorite King books and they all have read different King books. My dad has read different King books. My mom, my two brothers have read very different King books, tons of them. So they were like saying, oh, I like this one and this one. I don't like this one. Only my sister. I have a sister who hasn't read any King, but yeah, it's just crazy. Just fascinating to hear all the varied opinions about King and how many books he's written. He's so prolific. So. Yeah. It, it, and, uh, you know, and Dark Tower obviously extends a lot of people out into his other works. If they enjoy the tower, uh, they want to get that extended reading list that has like 30 books on it. Uh, I did not wow. necessarily do that. Yeah. Um, uh, Philip says he also needs to um, to finish. Uh, Wizarding Glass is my favorite yeah. of the Dark Tower series. Um, That's cool. I'm actually hoping to get to it this month, but I'm prioritizing Dust of Dreams because I just finished Toll the Hounds. So I want to nice. get on to that. Yeah. Yeah, you're getting close. You're getting close to the end uh, ending. I, I will be starting the Bone Hunters within seven days. That's I know that's a very precise thing, but I schedule my reading pretty, pretty tight throughout the month. And I think I'm actually going to get to it a little bit closer uh, or a little bit sooner rather than I thought I would. And I'm really, really excited to get back in Malaz. And uh, I did not a knives last month. Uh, halfway through the month and it was nice it was like a little treat right to kind of keep me checked into the malazan world but i'm ready to get back full tilt and i know the bone bone hunters is most people's favorite at least from what i read um or at least what i've heard so i'm really really excited about that oh did jo joanna freeze chat say something so i know it's not my internet <laughs> Oh no. Okay. Yeah. I see chat going. She froze. Okay. She'll be back. It's okay. Um, I actually had some things in chat here to catch up on. <laughs> Steve says, not you. Well, <laughs> all right. 
All right. I can catch back through. I see a lot of people talking about going into the dark tower. I absolutely recommend it. Just know it gets real, real weird. Um, I'm sure Joanna will be back with us shortly. Um, this seems like a good opportunity to make an announcement. Um, so I said in my community post, I had an announcement tonight. I actually made this announcement all right already. <clears throat> it was this past Wednesday on my house, of chain stream with Philip chase, but only a certain amount of people were going to be watching the stream since it's spoilers. So I wanted to do a large announcement right now. It's by best to do at the top of the show in two weeks on November 19th. I will be having a special guest on chatting with nuts uh, for one of these extended chats. And that guest on the 19th with chatting with nuts episode 18 will be Steven Erickson. Um, I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, we've never had an author on this channel, at least not a published author. I know a couple of my friends like to, uh, to write as I do, but Steven Erickson, you know, one of the best, um, most prolific fantasy authors of all time, uh, is going to be on the show to chat with me uh, in a live format. Um, I'm sure I'll be able to field him some of your questions as long as, uh, you know, obviously I, I feel like we have a pretty good crowd. Everyone will keep it respect won't have good uh, questions, uh, but it's not just a Malazan talk, right? So if you're watching, you say, eh, you know, I don't like Malazan or, you know, you haven't read it. Uh, one, I think it's a good opportunity to maybe get a, get from, from the author, you know, find out why you should read it. But on top of that, uh, this is really a chat about writing and fantasy in the genre as a whole and reading. So uh, there is going to be obviously some laws and talk. It'll be non-spoiler. But we're also going to get to talk to someone who has worked in the genre for the last however many years, right? Two, two, three decades. And I think it's a really, really cool opportunity to have a generic chat like this and talk about maybe some of the authors that uh, Erickson loves. Erickson, I know, is a big fan of Robin Hobb, which... So am I. Uh, so I do plan on finding out what uh, about her that he enjoys so much, because for me, I know what what makes me tick. And I know a lot of my viewers and also a lot of other booktubers and why they love her so much. Uh, but to hear it from another author's mouth, I think, could be uh, quite the experience. And I'm sure there's going to be other authors talked about and whatnot. So it's going to be a general chat just like this. Um, it won't be a super formal interview or anything like that. I do have some questions I want to ask him, but I think it's going to be really laid back. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I got to give AP and Philip a shout out for helping that happen. Um, if it wasn't for them, <laughs> it could have been, uh, it would have been hard probably to get that um, email. Um, Joanna just said she lost her neck and actually I'm trying to get back ASAP. Not a problem. Not a problem. Got to get all caught up in chat here. I'm riding, riding solo boys and girls run solo. Yeah, Steven Erickson. Hype level 9,000. Okay. Um, am I nervous? They say, they say, James, are you nervous? I say a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here drinking a monster re rehab at eight o'clock on a Friday, and I'm going to be interviewing one of the smartest men ever to write in fantasy. So yeah, I'm a little nervous, I guess. Um, but I don't think I'll make too big of an ass of myself. Maybe. <laughs> I would love to hear Erickson on Glenn Cook and the Black. Yeah, I'm going to bring that up. I haven't read it, uh, but if there's any, I, I want to read it anyways. So being able to hear him, and I know he was influenced by Glenn Cook, I think that would actually be a great, uh, great conversation piece, Mark. Good question. Erickson's great conversation. Talking about word, very, 10 very big books. Yes, I have also heard that. You won't shotgun that monster. Oh, Joanna's back. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> My internet just totally went out completely. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> it's, it's that new house internet. It never works on the first week. Yeah. It never works. You're going to have to have them come out. It's going to be a big thing. Um, I did make an announcement while you were gone. I don't know if, ah, if you saw that. I already know what it is, I'm sure. Yes, that Steven Erickson will be joining us in two weeks on Chatting with Nuts. And I think uh, Chatting with George, if I could get George R. R. Martin, Oh, wow. <laughs> on this um stay tuned i don't know who knows it's santa fe i, I know that <laughs> I, I, I can't say anything how about that i can't say anything about that um but i'm working on stuff guys i'm working on stuff um the support for this show and my channel in general has been uh humbling but it's also been quite a surprise 
And I am trying to put as much effort and money back into this thing as I can uh, to make this really special and to get those kind of talks uh, in, in a different way, right? Uh, a lot of people do interviews. A lot of people have a very structured thing. But I think there's something about opening up with someone like this in a long-form conversation that doesn't have a script uh, that is enticing. And I think it also shows a different side of people uh, in a good way. Um, I love stuff. it. I love it. I've been really enjoying all the episodes I've been able to watch so far. Um, it's fun stuff. It's very fun. Yeah. I, I mean, this is my favorite thing I do. And I feel like it's also the reason why my channel has gained some traction, um, which is awesome. You know, it, it's, it's an organic thing. I, I didn't, when I first started chatting with nuts, I don't know if I've ever said this on air. I was told by multiple people, uh, and, and they weren't being, uh, harmful, but they just said, Hey, you might want to make a second channel for that because of watch metrics and stuff. You're not going to grow. And, uh, at the end of the day, this is very much, um, just something this is a passion thing for me and it turns out not only um did i just continue to do what i was doing uh but it turns out they were wrong and my channel uh definitely grew because of chatting with nuts chatting with nuts is <laughs> really the core of this channel uh so it's just funny it was something i was told that maybe not might not be such a great idea um, but it's my favorite thing i do and i think it's also my viewers favorite thing so pretty awesome. i i think that was a very smart move on your part i I know a couple of years ago, it seemed like when I was watching a lot of different uh, kind of different corners of BookTube, it seemed like a lot of people were suddenly making new channels to do like vlogs and life stuff. And then I'm going to keep this channel as my book stuff and sub um, subscribe to both of my channels. And it just I felt like it never worked for people who did that. Never. <laughs> like, And then they'd end up combining everything at the end of the day anyway. So I think just keeping everything in the same channel is a good idea. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, and it, this is very much like an on, um, it's, it's about me and my reactions and my um, experiences with other people and books and stuff like that. So I don't really see a need to have like a second channel or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I just kind of went with it and it's worked out. Um, I appreciate it. everyone's very kind. Thank yeah. you. Very, it's yeah. very, very, very kind of you all. Um, so you were saying that you don't have a ton of physical books. Okay. And it's funny because I've hit the point. <laughs> Folks, I got a downsize. I mean, I have I bought a new shelf and it's full. And can we just be honest? All my book collectors, I know Baron's in the chat. All my book collectors out there. We got to be honest. We don't ever have to admit this ever again out loud. E-readers are easily the best way to read a book. And I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. and, and this is someone who doesn't use a Z reader ever, but we got to be honest. There's better accessibility options. Uh, the screen is brighter. Um, generally the only time it isn't as good as a physical book is in the sun. Um, and also the fact that the books are generally cheaper though. The prices are getting a little outrageous for eBooks. Um, you can read multiple books on one device. You save all this space. I mean, Listen, again, I'm never going to honor this out loud again as someone who loves physical books, but it, it, I get frustrated with myself when I run out of shelf space because I go, why do I own these mass market paperbacks when I could have got it on ebook? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. My favorite thing about ebooks is that, and I didn't ever think I would be an ebook reader ever. Like that is something I never thought I would ever want to do because I always thought physical books are superior. But my favorite thing about ebooks is how you like on the Kindle app, how you can highlight things. Yes. I, would, I don't feel comfortable highlighting physical books. I don't. I, yeah. But I could, I actually color code, highlight on the Kindle and write notes, type out notes and use the search feature like crazy. So if there's a name that comes up, you could do the search feature to see if it came up before or the x-ray feature. It's fantastic for so many different things. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. And uh, one thing Jake brought up, and I think that he's on to something. And, and when we were talking about Malazan, this is the reason why I didn't do Malazan on a Kindle is because I want to hit that glossary. And um, I do think even if you make a note or like a, a, a marker in the back of the book, for some reason, it seems more like a pain on the Kindle to get to the glossary. I don't know what it is. It's just it's just a thing. And I don't know why. I agree. Um, I totally agree with that. Yeah. You know, and I feel silly for saying that because it really isn't a thing. <laughs> like it's it's certainly not. Uh, but I I've been reading Prince of Nothing and I've been in that. Like I read two pages and I'm in the, I'm in the glossary. If mm -hmm. I was doing that on Kendall, I think it'd be a little bit disrupting. 
And the other thing is Pratchett. I read Guards Guards on Kindle and it was a, it was on my little e-reader Kindle and it it was a nightmare because of the footnotes. <laughs> Cuz it kept oh. having to like zoom it had to it was weird. It seemed like have to flip to the end of the book where the footnotes were. It was weird. Oh, it, it just, know, like, that's, just, that's interesting because so um, I'm not a huge fan of the Discworld the editions, like the tall, skinny ones that are really, really strange. Mm -hmm. So I was actually planning on doing all e-reader format, but I forgot about the footnotes. That could be a deal breaker. Yeah, well, I, in my work with like more um, updated versions of e-readers, I just know I have like a really old generic one that I got from a family member and I read it on that and it was awful for that. <laughs> it yeah. just didn't work very well at all. So I wouldn't, I don't know, just test it out. Maybe make sure that the footnotes are in line with the page. Uh, I I would prefer that personally. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of times the footnotes, I think what I've noticed in Kindle, there'll be like a little number and then you have to click on the number and then it takes you out of the page. Mm. Uh, but it might be different. On, like I said, it might be different on more updated Kindles. So here's how I'm going to, I'm going to get every Discworld fan mad at me. Just don't read the footnotes. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Alan just punched a steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big fan of footnotes typically, but of course they are. Yeah. They're good. I mean, they're, I loved guards guards. I still want to read on in that series for sure. Yeah. Discworld's one that I've been slacking that I need to get back mm -hmm. into. And Sarah brings up a good point. The uh, Libby, aka library app must, uh, most always has both eBooks and audio available. I can't tell you how much money, Libby yeah. has saved me. If you're not yeah. using Libby, it's a free app. You can link your free library card to, and you can get eBooks, audiobooks to your phone and you can push them to your Kindle. It's incredible. I love it. I love Libby. <laughs> yeah, Rhythma is the one that put me on Libby and mm -hmm. I owe her a lot of money because <laughs> it has yeah. saved me. <laughs> well, that's the other reason I haven't been as active on collecting books is just, mm -hmm. I, used I used the library like crazy. And after a year, I was like, wow. I can't even imagine how much money I've saved oh, and especially cool. seems worth it when some of the books I know I'd never read again, or I didn't care about that much. Um, th that's a little less the case now. I think I've refined my reading taste more and been much more, uh, I don't know. I've been able to figure out what works for me a little bit more. So most of the books like I'm collecting are ones that I would want to reread or that have been meaningful to me in some way. Yeah, the library I, is so wonderful. It saves so much money. So I tell myself I'm only going to get books that I really love or there's a collector's edition of. And then I lie to myself and I walk into Barnes and Noble and I go, I'm going to buy everything <laughs> that looks kind of neat. And then what happens is I donate a bunch of stuff that I knew I shouldn't have bought. And then I'm right back to square one with full shelves. Like, for instance, I picked up uh, the rest of the Osternard series by Tad Williams. If you read Tad Williams, you know, all of his books are yay about that wide. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you know, three or four of those. And I'm like, the new shelf is out. It's gone. So. Yeah. <laughs> My biggest thing. Barnes and Noble regret is that I didn't buy the long price quartet when I saw it there so many years ago. Oh. And now you can't find that bind up anymore because of Alan. <laughs> that, that damn <laughs> yeah. Alan. Uh, yep. Damn, Alan. He uh, yep. he said he really doesn't like reading on a screen. And I will say this, Alan. Um, one of the reasons why I do shy away from my Kindle so much is because I program all day, and my eyes are just so fatigued from screens that Kindle feels too similar to work. Even though I know it's an ink screen and all that stuff, um, it's one of the reasons why I don't read on an iPad. It's just because I'm always staring at an OLED screen, and I'm like, ah. Uh, I'd like the break of physical books. And another big thing about mm -hmm. physical books, I don't know how, if you feel this way, especially with like Malaz and books, mm -hmm. seeing that bookmark yes. make a little bit of progress every day. <laughs> it's, oh, definitely. It's a big motivator. Motivator, sure. endorphin, endorphin pumper. I mean, it's great. Yes, absolutely. Especially with, because they're so big. So you feel like you're making progress on that. Oh, yeah, that'd be a big deal. Some of my favorite series. Yeah, what are what are some of your favorite series is the question. Well, right now, Malaz and Book of the Fallen is, you know, I haven't finished the 10 books yet, but I mean, just how much I've gotten out of it so far, it's definitely a favorite. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire is one of my favorites. Oh, I just cool. love it. I, I don't know if Lord of the Rings counts as a series. It's probably more of a standalone, but I love Lord of the Rings. 
Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that I've read. Lord of the uh, Rings is six books. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I haven't read the Summerillion though, too. So yeah, so the six books though, just the three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> six and three. Yeah. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the other series. What else have I read? <laughs> so look over here. Yeah. Um, I I was reading. Uh, oh yeah, I I really enjoyed the first Law trilogy, and I read Best Served Cold. I need to continue on in the first Law world. Um, I don't know some of the, before this year, I was reading a lot of Sanderson and I probably would have put Sanderson up there, but I actually got kind of burnt out on Sanderson at the end of the last year. Cause I read so much at the end. That's uh, um, kind of where I was too, actually. Really? Yeah. 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 I still but, love Stormlight. Um, mm -hmm. but by the time I finished Rhythm of War, I was ready. Like I haven't read any Sanderson this year and I won't. Yeah. Um, and it has not, and it's not because I don't enjoy Sanderson or anything. It was yeah. like, okay, I want to like he's not he's not one of my favorite authors, so like I want to experience other things, right? I've I've read enough books by him to know he's not like a top five guy for me, even though Stormlight could be a top five series possibly. Um, so I wanted to kind of put him on the back burner, you know. And it's the same reason why I haven't read like uh, there's two other George books I really want to read, George R. R. Martin books, but I'm putting those off, right? Because with George, I already know I, I'm he's a top two author for me right mm -hmm. so i just want to find other other new favorites right yes absolutely and i really enjoyed rothfuss too i enjoyed the name of the wind oh yeah wise man's fear um i my husband and i both actually enjoyed those books but we both just actually unhauled those books because i don't know we just felt kind of done with like i don't know if we'll reread this anytime soon <laughs> yeah so um yeah um I, and there are so many series I need to read, honestly. So like for me, I uh, started my journey with, uh, I guess, Tolkien, a little bit of Tolkien. I didn't finish The Lord of the Rings, but I started it in high school and tried to reread it several times, like in The Hobbit. And I read The Elric Saga by Michael Moorcock when I was a teen. And then it, I read some other things, um, some Patricia McKillop, I think is the name of the author, and some David Eddings. And then I took a long break from fantasy, went back into it with Martin, A Song of Ice and Fire. And then I went into Dune and got into some classic sci-fi. Uh, and then I took a long break again from fantasy. And when I came back, um, I didn't know really what to read. And that was when around the time I discovered BookTube. And at the time I was mostly finding a lot of like young adult content on BookTube for a long time. <laughs> And so I was reading a lot of YA, honestly, and it was fun. I think it was a good way to kind of get back into reading when you haven't been reading for fun in many years. Yeah. But then uh, I started getting into Sanderson because I wanted to get back into fantasy. I saw the Long Price Quartet, like I said, in the bookstore, and then I didn't pick it up because I, re biggest regret, biggest regret. <laughs> Who knew how rare they would become? I know. And I didn't pick it up because I didn't hear about it on BookTube. I heard about Sanderson. So I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll pick up Mistborn since that's a little cheaper. And I keep hearing about that. But um, yeah, so I got into a lot of Sanderson, it seemed like. And, yeah. uh, you know, some Rothfuss. I read through the whole entire Witcher series. And while I am glad I read it, I wouldn't say it's a favorite. Um, but I still really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the characters. I still appreciated the story, I guess. Yeah, and there's so many copies out there that if if you wanted to reread, you could pick them up at the used bookstore for like four bucks. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a trade paperback that was like four or five dollars, and I'm I'm gonna actually donate it because I got the anniversary edition. That's really nice. At least I think it's nice. It has like the red pages and like the kind of gold uh, binding on it. It's nice. Um, and I got that from I think Books a Million. I think. Oh, cool. Um, so like, but I have this trade paperback sitting here, and I'm like, I don't need this. So I, I just need to donate that as well. Um, yeah. But I'm yeah. so bummed because I don't have any really good used bookstores where I live. So oh. yeah, I, I well, I could travel a, about an hour and a half to one, but yeah, not nearby. So all I have nearby really is Barnes and Noble. It's, it's nice to have Barnes and Noble, but. Yeah. I, I spend a decent amount of time. It, you know, it's kind of weird. People used to say, oh, don't shop at Barnes and Noble. Don't shop at Books a Million. But now we're at a point where like these physical stores are getting more and more scarce, um, at least mm -hmm. here in America. And it's like, 
uh, man, if it's all, it's all you got, you actually should. Uh, Cause we want to keep these places around. Like I know I, I, I do buy local when I can, but at the end of the day, like, so a bookstore is better than no bookstore. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if that's going to change because of the book shortage that everybody keeps talking about. Maybe. 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 You know, people to Barnes and Noble and places like that. Mm. Yeah. I think that rating is also in an upswing. And I think it's because for some reason, social media um, is just now, I mean, it's, it's been pushing reading forward and forward, but it is really starting to become uh, mainstream. Uh, book talk as much as I joke and I, and I crap on it. Uh, it has done a ton for reading. I mean, millions of views on book reviews. I mean, we, we would never have expected that five years ago. Yeah. Um, now maybe the review and the content or the book or whatever is not my cup of tea, but regardless people reading is always a good thing in my, it at least in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Um, and th this kind of segues good into stars question for you, Joanna it says, what background in your life, if any, led you to the genres and tropes you prefer to read? Hmm, that's such a good question. Um, so, <laughs> so a couple of things. When I was, it's what got me really into fantasy, I think I kind of, I always kind of joke that I feel like I grew up a little bit in fantasy culture. I mean, in addition to growing up with campy movies like Labyrinth and Dark Crystal and yeah. uh, Princess Bride and things like that, that I absolutely loved growing up. I also, when I was in high school, it's a little embarrassing now, but I hung out with a bunch of LARPers, live action role players. And That's in now. And Don't worry. Players, and those were my friends. And because of those groups, and actually they were a pretty positive influence on me, I'll be honest, because, you know, a lot of people make fun of them for being nerds, like D&D players are nerds, and that kind of thing. But for me, they were a very positive influence on me. They actually got me more, in, like I hung out with people who, we're into Stephen King when they were kids. I'm sure a lot of people in the chat can relate to that too. And yep. we read Dune several times as teens, that kind of thing. And so I wasn't much of a reader when I was that age, or at least not an adult fantasy reader. So they made me very interested in reading and learning more. And so that was what got me into fantasy. My friend lent me The Hobbit. And because I was into this whole fantasy world with my friends, I just thought it was just so amazing. It just, it just opened something up really special for me. So that was really what got me into reading fantasy, the genre that I love the most to this day. I love reading other genres as well, but I find it's fun to read another genre now and then, but I always want to go back to fantasy. I just always want to go back to fantasy for whatever reason. It just has my heart. And then the other thing that uh, really appeals to me, I'm going to do a video on this at some point, but I love, this is kind of cheesy, but I love time travel books. And I, oh, yeah. I, I just love time travel or even just the play on time. If there are books that kind of play with time, um, even the Dark Tower, the way that does that a little bit, like characters, and, I, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but there's a really cool play on time there. I love that. And I think that goes back to growing up and back to the future of being on loop in my household. <laughs> um, my older brothers were obsessed with that movie and they could quote the whole entire movie to this day. And maybe that's why, but I just love time travel. I, I love it. So that's honestly a favorite kind of theme or trope for me when it comes to books or even just a play on time. And another one is just related to that, I guess. And kind of going off time is memory, the, the sort of play on memory. I think that those kinds of things are very powerful for me. Yeah, I think uh, the more I read, the more I appreciate kind of like meta aspects of either tra time traveling or existence. And I think that's why I'm currently reading The Prince of Nothing by our Scott Baker. Mm -hmm. And I did a review for book one, folks, book three of that trilogy is outstanding, outstanding. Wow. It is an entire, I mean, the theme of self-identity and identity within the world is explored in the most meta way possible uh, while still being very deep and philosophical uh, without it feeling cheesy. Uh, man, uh, just hearing you say this and like, I've, I've been reading Dune. I just, I saw people talking about Evie was talking about in the chat. Uh, they're actually asking what you think of Dune, but, uh, I read Dune Messiah and while Dune Messiah was not my favorite book, 
I did enjoy Doom Messiah for what it was trying to accomplish and like what it was about. Yes. I just um, read that this past month. What'd yeah. you think of it? What'd you think of Doom Messiah? I, I thought it, you know, I, who was it? I heard somebody, maybe it was you. I heard you say this and I thought that was really brilliant. <laughs> so oh, I heard you. Jimmy say that it kind of functions as a really good, kind of like an epilogue. Isn't that the word you use? Yes. I really like that description because it felt like it was kind of an extension of Dune, but to me, it felt much more contained. It didn't feel quite like as, uh, like it had quite the reverberation as the first book. And I, but I, what I, one thing I really love about Dune is I feel like it has a, especially with the sort of abilities of the spice and things like that. Mm -hmm. And also the commentary on government and religion and looking at that, I love how it sort of seems to look at paradox. It kind of has a play on paradox. You know what I mean? So like, I, I like, I don't want to say anything as a spoilers, but there are some really cool quotes in there that kind of make you think outside the box about certain concepts yeah. uh, in a less, less sort of linear way. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think it also says, what is it to be a chosen one? And remember, you know, yeah. with Dune being written back in the 60s, uh, this is a very different time or not. A, I mean, it's been explored, but not to that level. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you. If everything I've read, like I do know Malaz is very inspired by Dune. I think the second apocalypse Prince of Nothing trilogy by R. Scott Baker is like the best. It's the best work that's obviously inspired by Dune that I've read. Um, I do need to read Sun Eater by Christopher Rocchio, and I will be uh, early in 2022 in January. But oh, my goodness. So we know Paul is a ch I, I, this isn't spoilers, but Paul is clearly a chosen one, right? Yes. I want you to imagine if Paul was a sociopathic monk because <laughs> that that is uh, Kellis in the Prince of Nothing series. Um and it's like, okay, we have a Paul, we have a chosen one, but he doesn't have basic empathy. Oh. How, how scary is that? And being able to manipulate people. And uh, it, it's very strange. Uh, I think it's, 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 oh man, I'm very high on the Prince of Nothing. And the reason I'm talking about so much, I have like a hundred or less pages left in the third book. And I'm just like, I'm vibing with it really hard. And, yeah. and I really enjoyed doing the movie. I loved it so much. And uh, Doom Messiah, well, again, wasn't my favorite book of the year, but I still appreciated a lot of what I was doing. So I feel like I'm just in this chosen one spin zone, you know, where I'm trying to grab on to what it means to for that trope um, and to be the chosen one. Yeah, And you also touched on one of my favorite uh, themes or concepts to explore in books too, which is identity. I love identity. I love exploring archetypes. I love all types of things. And that actually, for me, somebody, you know, related to that question I was asked before, I, I think like I've always been into personality assessments and sort of analyzing like self-concept. That's been a huge interest of mine. And so, yeah, I love the way that's explored. And I like the way that that's explored in Dune, especially because it kind of takes the chosen one and makes it bigger than the person in a way. And I really like that. Uh, and yes. And what will people do in the name of a chosen one mm -hmm. or a prophet or a Messiah? Right. Um, identity right. also can play even just on simple terms. And this is again, something that I've, I've been reading in Prince of nothing. You know, uh, one of the characters is a prostitute and it's everything she does, no matter how far she goes, she always says, you know, I'm, I'm the prostitute. And people and still people who knew her when she was just a prostitute, you know, that's the prostitute. And um, it's weird because even in moments of success, it's in the back of her mind. Um, mm -hmm. Or uh, Ak Akamian, um, who is essentially a like middle aged sorcerer who just hates his job, which is just an amazing character to start off with. You know, he's constantly thinking about his slip ups in life and wh who he is as an idea identity and then you have like a barbarian who is known as the weeper because he cries and his his people look down on him because he cries right and every time he messes i'm the weeper i'm the weeper and it's just like this identity struggle with these characters throughout this trilogy and it's so interesting and do they challenge their con self concepts or they're just like this is who i am they do but then they also do fall into those things and mm -hmm. i think at times they use their they use what identity suits their purpose meaning if they mess up 
they say I messed up because mm-hmm. I am the pro I am the weeper. That's why I messed up. And it's fascinating to see how they f- go in and out of that based on where they are um, in their goals. I can't wow. say a lot because I don't want to spoil things, but man, our Scott Baker does identity play better than anybody. Oh, that's fascinating. It's really that's good. Interesting. Do you, how would you say the female characters are in that? Because that's something I know that the series is often compared to Moaz and Book of the Fallen. Mm-hmm. That's something that has blown me away about Moaz and Book of the Fallen is how Steven Erickson writes female characters. I mean, point blank, um, the Prince of Nothing trilogy is brutal. Uh, tons of abuse. Um, women have a very tough time in this world. There is no doubt about it. However, I don't think that exploring those things is necessarily our Scott Baker endorsing those things. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think any, I think it's clearly a critique. I think uh, Esmonette is the, is the character I'm thinking of. I think she's a phenomenal female character. Um, and she lives in a very mi- misogynistic world. She has a lot to overcome. Terrible things happen to her. Um, and really, Kellis is out here just taking advantage of most people in this story anyways, because he's a sociopath. <laughs> so, uh, it, I mean, it's just one of those things where like, you know, I've talked about Robin Hobb so much on this channel and I've screamed to the rooftops, read Robin Hobb, read Robin Hobb. Um, I feel like our Scott Baker this year would be like second to Robin Hobb. Like that's how good I think he is. But because of how grotesque and grim Prince of Nothing is, it's very hard for me to then go out and say everyone, everyone go read our Scott Baker's The Prince of Nothing, because there's a lot of people who probably don't want to read these things um, that that happen in this book. Now, to be fair, a lot of this stuff happens in other series, too. Mm-hmm. Like Malazan has a lot of really, really oh, grim stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I feel like if someone can handle uh, like a depth of Malazan's grimness, I think that they could handle The Prince of Nothing. Um, but I also respect the fact that some people don't want to read about these things. But um, so in my opinion, the women characters are good, but they do go through a tremendous amount of adversity. Um, but I think there's good character development, and I think there's a really good uh, examination of what trauma does to someone. Mm. Um, and it's just it's just deep. Like it's not a it's not a joy ride. There's very little humor. Um, yeah. There is some humor, uh, but man, is it heavy. <laughs> That's another thing that I, I don't know why I always gravitate towards the exploration of trauma and agency and like how much agency do we have when we're acting from a place of trauma. It's like the poppy war. That was my favorite thing about the poppy war was just seeing how Rin is dealing with that. And so I, I yeah, I just love that kind of exploration, even though it could be incredibly brutal and triggering regarding certain content <laughs> for that. Yeah, I uh, I think that if that's the case, you could enjoy Prince of Nothing quite a bit. Mm. Um, I, I'm going to read a quote, actually. This okay. I don't mean to turn this into a Prince of Nothing <laughs> uh, uh, thing, but uh, these are the, uh, qu- this is a quote that I love. And it says, to open a book was not only to seize a moment of helplessness, not only to relinquish a jealous handful of heartbeats to the unpredictable mark of another man's quill. It was to allow oneself to be written. For what was a book, if not a long consecutive surrender to the movements of another soul? Whoa. <laughs> and what he's saying there is the book reads us, which everyone says, everyone talks about. But like, that's what that means. Like, is it not a vulnerable thing to pick up a book like Prince of Nothing that does go through these things and say, I am going to find out what this means to me. And, and, and the book reads you. It's very interesting. Wow. That's interesting. The book uh, reads you. I'm just yes, trying to wrap yes. my head around that. Well, me and Philip talked about this the other night, but if you think about it, um, you read a book and then you read it again five years later, it's a different book. It's the same yes. book, but you, you're you different, right? Yes. And do you have any choice over that? That's my question. I, I kind of brought this up recently in a video. We didn't really explore that, but... Uh, it was like about what affects us as reviewers um, and readers. I had a discussion with AP and Philip and Brittany from Books with Brittany about this. And I guess so that is a question that I'm fascinated by is like we, you know, it's easy to get upset. People don't love the books that we love or um, or we want to love books like you, you telling me about this. I'm like, I want to love The Prince of Nothing. <laughs> what if I don't? And what, what how much control over that experience do I have? 
especially given my age or where I am in life, my background, maybe me, me being female plays a role in that given what female characters go through. So I don't know. That's, I don't know if that's related to that quote or not, but it's something that I question. I think it's in the same realm. I think it's in the same realm. Absolutely. Um, and, and how we react to different books at different times in our life and different times of our day. I mean, it all matters, right? Yeah. Jake asks, Jimmy, which character is more of a sociopath, the guy from Prince of Nothing or Kenneth? Easily the guy from Prince of Nothing. His name's Kellis. Easily. It's not even close. What's Kenneth from? I'm sorry. Kenneth that. is from the Live Ship Traders trilogy. Yeah. It is probably the greatest antagonist ever written, in my opinion. I can't wait to read that. I, next year, I am prioritizing Robin Hobb. I'm at least prioritizing the Farseer trilogy, but if all goes well, maybe Ship of Magic as well. Yeah, I think you would love Ship of Magic. Oh, if you do, <laughs> let's, let's have a conversation because I think okay. Live Ships is phenomenal. The character arcs in that series are among my favorite. Um, Storybound says, I like the idea of bringing your thoughts and baggage to the book and it's creating your interpretation. Super neat idea. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I think that's reading. I think this is why it's such a interesting thing to hear other people's thoughts. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll read one more quote from the Prince of Nothing. If, if my uh, audience and, and Joanna will allow me. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Should I? I say Joanna, but I also like saying Joanna. Do you have a preference? <laughs> yeah, like, it's Joanna. Joanna. Um, I had a German teacher, though, who called me Johanna, which is how you would say it. In German. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is uh, a great quote to start out. Um, and it's actually, there's literature inside of this literature, by the way, like the characters write, but not for the sake of being like, oh, they wrote something like it feels real. Uh, and this is one of the things uh, that Drusus Ak Akamian says. So uh, if one doubts that passion and unreason govern the fate of nations, one need only look to meetings between the great kings and emperors are unused to treating with equals and are often excessively relieved or repelled as a result. Um, the Nil and the Meshi have a saying when princes meet, they find either brothers or themselves, which is to say either peace or war. Hmm. Interesting. I'd have to pick that apart because there's this first part about unreason or. or... Well, it's the fact. So it, the idea is, is that, let, you know, if we have two leaders of nations come together, how yeah. often, how often do they speak to someone or on the same level? Everyone's beneath them. Yes. So when they meet, it is either a great relief to finally have someone to talk to, or it is a challenge mm -hmm. and, and they feel threatened. And so that's why they either find brothers, right? Someone on the same or, or themselves, which if it's themselves, it's a threat, which is to say it will either be peace or war. Yeah. And to think that war that is then dancing on the edge of an ego of an elite. Very yeah. disturbing. Yeah. Very disturbing. Absolutely. Yeah. Horrible like, criticism of, uh, of leadership and nobility in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So this, this, I'm, I'm telling you, like Prince of Nothing is just packed full of this stuff. Uh, and when you just start reading, I mean, whew, it, you can have an existential crisis reading this. Series. It sounds dark. It sounds really dark. It's yeah. very dense. It's also very dense. It's one of the, I think it is from people who like Malazan and enjoy getting lost in that world. I think <laughs> that our Scott Baker offers something extraordinarily similar in a lot of ways. Uh, but I would say it's told in a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A more common way of the third person perspective getting inside their heads. Whereas Malaz and, you know, we have a different type of characterization in the way he tells the story. I think our Scott Baker is a little closer to Germ in, in that regard, just for an example. Um, but he has the, his world has the depth um, that people look for when they try to read Malaz. And so. Mm, interesting. So would you say that it, because it, I mean, that quote in particular sounds like a very cynical view of nobility and leadership. And oh yes, so do you, is there is there are there any hopeful sort of threads in there in the mm. book? Or because like Malazan is very there, you know, there's a lot of darkness. It's a very dark world. It's brutal, but at the same time, it's sort of balanced with a lot of lighter aspects like humor. And compassion, just to name a couple of things, um, there are some hopeful messages in there too. So, would you say that there's any of that, like any light in the darkness? There, there <laughs> is. There, there is because I think at times, 
Um, the very few shreds of empathy we see in the world is like a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Um, so I would say, yes, I don't think it's as <laughs> hopeful <laughs> as yeah. Mawazin is, if yeah. I'm being honest. Um, yeah. Because one thing that Erickson does extraordinarily well is friendships. Um, I don't know. There is one friendship I'm thinking in The Prince of Nothing that's rather good. But I would say on a, on a, the whole thing, I would say it's much darker. Mm. Much more nihilistic. Yeah, ni nihilistic. Good word. Yes. Yes, definitely nihilistic, I would say. Uh, Star asks, for both of you, which books have you read the most times over any other? Um, that's easily A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, easily. and you're rereading it right now. Yeah. How's that going? Well, we did a reread of Game of Thrones. And, uh, well, I'm going to be honest. We're on Leanna's channel. If you haven't watched it yet, I got a little drunk. Uh, <laughs> I should the, go like that. The cups were flowing and we were having a good time. And we did three hours talking about book one. Wow. And some of it is a little rambly because the again, you know, the mead and everything was flowing. But uh it's amazing what you can still get out of those books, even on like I, yeah. six, seven, three read. It's 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 crazy. But what what's yours? What's your most reread book? I you know, honestly, I, I haven't reread a lot of books. <laughs> um, I I can't think of most books I haven't reread more than once. I, I've only reread books like twice. Um, so I guess I could put the like Fellowship of the Ring I've read a couple of times, The Hobbit I've read a couple of times. Um, and then I've tried to start over again many times with those and I I never let's see. Um I'm trying to think of what else. I've reread Good Omens by Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett. I'm reading okay. that for the first time starting Yay. probably Sunday. Oh, fun. Yeah, yeah. that's a fun one. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I really haven't reread a lot of books, though. And I I really want to, though. I want to, like I said, I, re I read the Elric saga when I was about 19, 18, 19 years old. And that was a long time ago now. <laughs> and it seems to have been also going through a renaissance lately. I know there's going to be a reprinting of that. So I really want to reread re the Elric saga. And I really want to read reread A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, I saw Bookish Drummer was in the chat. He is a huge, by the way, he's a huge Martin fan. He's read everything Martin, obscure Martin, as well as everything Stephen King. But we were both talking about that, about how Martin, to me, is so brilliant at uh, doing incredible character work oh, yeah. and plot work at the same time. Like I just, yeah, I it. it's so I, impressive the way he does it. I was talking to uh, my friend Christian the other day and I just said, and he's rereading as well. Um, and it's like, George just has the secret sauce, man. Yeah. Like he has the sauce. Um, and the one thing that surprised me going back to a game, uh, you know, I've read a, uh, probably like 150 to 160 books since the last time I read a game of Thrones. And I was surprised at how good the characters were like, you know, I know they're good characters, right? Like I know they're good. I forgot how good against the whole genre he is, you know, he's written some of the best of all time. Uh, and you're right. He doesn't sacrifice the plot moving forward for his subplots. At least uh, I should say in the first three, I think he does meander a little bit in books four and five. I happen to really like it, them still. But I love all five books. <laughs> I do too. No, yeah, that I'm yeah. just, you know, I, I'm not going to say he's, you know, um, flawless, right? Uh, yeah. I can see why some people don't like Feast for Crows and a Dance with a Drag. I do. But I think it's specifically the first three are so tight um, and are pushing forward this arc while also building some of the best characters in my opinion in the genre um i mean i think i think he's awesome i love him <laughs> he's I, my I favorite agree too. i i'm very eager once i saw you were rereading those i was thinking oh i wish i could join into that because i would, i would love to reread those books yeah we're I doing clash of kings this month and we'll be talking about it at the end of this month on alex's channel for anyone that's checking out i also made in the song of ice and fire reread playlist on my channel. So if you haven't checked out the, uh, the game of Thrones stream, it is there in the playlist nice. here on the channel. Um, and reading rainbow says, what are Joanna's fresh thoughts on Toll the hounds? Oh, wow. <laughs> Cause I literally just finished that book today. This Ooh, let's go. Yes. Oh, Give us wow. some non-spoiler thoughts. Hmm. Okay. So with Toll the hounds, I, what, one thing I'll say is that I, I would say that 
it is very wise when you're reading this series to go in with an open mind for every single book. Do not expect all the hounds to be, don't expect the bone hunters to be like memories of ice. Don't expect all the hounds to be like the bone hunters or, you know, and I, I was, I think it helped that, um, you know, honestly, I think one thing that helped was hearing so many people not like this book. So it kind of told me, okay, keep a very open mind. <laughs> Fight the mob opinion, Joanna. Um, oh, this is a hard one. Mm, how do I explain it? So I liked it. I really, really liked it. There is a lot to process. It does get, to me, it feels, I'm trying to see if I can articulate this the right way. To me, it feels like the themes in this book, in Toll the Hounds, are carry the story more than the story carries the themes, if that makes sense. Um, there are like very clear, there's a very clear storyline, very clear threads, but it's just the themes in this book. It's, uh, I don't know. I just felt like it was like every other page I was seeing like, oh, this is a recurring theme. This is a recurring theme. That's and how I felt about Doom like, Messiah. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of felt that way with Doom Messiah too, yeah. Uh, I, and I did like with Doom Messiah, I highlighted like, I feel like every other page noticing different philosophical um, threads there. And with the Bone Hunters, there's just a lot with that going on. I can understand, um, I can understand conflicting feelings on it though. Like with Toll the Hounds, we don't have major sieges like we do with other books. We do have Krupp again, Krupp. I don't know how to say his Krupp. name. We have Krupp back Or, in or my favorite, Krupe. <laughs> Krupe, yes. <laughs> and he sort of seems to, to function as sort of like a, a omniscient narrator, I guess. Or uh, he sort of is a narrator in the story, kind of telling all these different things happening with different people. It's really strange. The way, it's interesting the way it sort of um, shifts the narration style in this book. But I would say like there is a big kind of convergence, Malazan kind of convergence thing at the end. But overall, it's different. And there is a lot. I know that he wrote this when his father died. I will say that I feel like that book, this book has a lot of anger in it. <laughs> that was what I felt reading it. It has a wow. lot of rage. Even the word rage comes up a lot. And there were some things, honestly, and not in a bad way, but there were, well, I don't know. There were some things that made me very, very angry. <laughs> While I was reading it, there were some characters I got so angry at, and uh, it was good though. I mean, in a I was good, in a good way or a bad yeah, way, because in a good way. Cause I've been mad a couple times reading a book, and that's when I know that it, it got me, you know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, mm. like that, get, that automatically puts it up another notch yeah. when it gets me to a, a really elicit a, a true visceral reaction, yeah. yeah. Um, just being totally transparent though, there is uh. There is a sexually triggering scene, a rape scene. I'm just gonna say that, and uh, it, I, I didn't quite, I did not like it, <laughs> um, and I, I'm struggling to kind of gather my thoughts on that scene, and we'll need to process my thoughts on that scene. Uh, I'm used to reading that kind of content in books, but the way it happened in this book, uh, I just have to process my thoughts on it. I don't know how I'm going to talk about that yet. But overall, I still, I think I really liked the book. I liked the book. I did expect it to be different. It was different. And I, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to continue on as soon as possible. I'm picking up Dust of Dreams really soon. You only have two left. Two left, yeah. They wow. take me forever to get through. I don't know how you're getting through these. Ser you're, you're amazing. And the fact that you're getting through this series so quickly. But well, Joanna, see, <laughs> I have this is thing called not having a life. Um, <laughs> And, and I have a very patient wife that those are the two ways that I'm able to read so much. Yeah. Um, and I just don't do anything else. So it's like, okay, well, you know, for instance, today before the stream, um, I, I was getting this new stream yard stuff. So I got my new camera set up, all this stuff. And I said, okay, I got two and a half hours. I was like, I just bought a new game for my Nintendo switch. I was like, Ooh, maybe I'll play a video game. I was like, Ooh, I got, I got some YouTube videos in the backlog and I already got my reading done for the day. You know what I did? I read. I read. <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful though. Yay. I, and it's, you know, it's not one of, it's one of those things where, so I'm a very much a routine person and part of my routine is reading. So 
I tend to just do things that I do every day more when I have free time, uh, whether that be working out, um, whether that be coding, whether that be hanging out with my wife um, or reading. And that's just kind of the person I am. And, and lately I've been kind of off my uh, I've been off kilter a little bit because uh, my neck is kind of hurt right now and I have a rib thing going on. And my toe is also possibly broke. I don't know what's wrong with my toe. Oh, no. uh, but do you know how that happened? Oh, jujitsu, just grappling. Oh, yeah. You, you do jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. I do jujitsu, oh. and uh, I was ta I was uh, rolling with a gentleman. He's a white belt, but he, he's rather good. And yeah. he's probably like six six. I'd say he's like 250, 260. And uh, you know, meathead me, not realizing that I'm getting older. I'm like, I'm gonna double leg take down this dude. Uh, so I did, and I put my head in his chest. And when I did, he did not move as easy as I thought he would. So my neck just like, you know, oh, kind of cracked. No. And I'm like, oh, all right, that didn't feel good. So I, I do get to take down. So that, that helps my pride. Um, we end up getting up, and he ends up stepping on my foot when we're getting up. And <sighs> immediately, I'm like, my toe is snapped. I'm like, there's no way my toe isn't broken right now. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, whenever he hurt my foot, then we fell, and he fell on top of me, and I felt my. So it was like in a thirty second span, everything just went very wrong for me, um, and yeah. So, anyways, the, the whole yeah. point of that story <laughs> is the fact that I have to rest this week. Like I can't lift. I lifted once, and I wasn't able to jiu jitsu at all. So for me, being out of that routine, it's like, okay, what do you do? And you know what I did? I just read like a madman, like a total mad person. <laughs> I wish I could do that. I don't know why. I just don't have the stamina. <laughs> well, you know, I love to read, and I try to read. Uh, I, I try to read as much as I can, but man, it's hard for me to keep going and going and going. I don't know. I, I get restless. Yeah, I actually think that well, the thing it's helping me out, and thing that has really increased my stamina. And this is weird. I I talked about some of my wrap ups. If you watch wrap up, you heard this, and I, I won't monologue about it too much. But I've always been. And I'm curious how you are, Joanna. Uh, do you read one book at a time or do you read multiple books at a time? I heard, oh, I wanted to ask you about this. Let's do I, it, yeah. I heard you talk about it in your wrap up. Um, yeah, I actually have a video on my channel I did earlier this year called The Multiple Books Experiment for Me because I've always been a one book at a time person. But I do, I have also regularly listened to one audio book. So I'll usually have one physical book and one audio book less with the audiobooks lately. Right now I am listening to an audiobook, uh, which is a nonfiction book. I'm listening to Dave Grohl's The Storyteller, which is the drummer of Nirvana and Foo Fighters guy. Yes. Um, so that's been interesting. I've been interested. I've been fascinated by that. Uh, but yeah, usually I'm a one book at a time person. I did try to do multiple books at once, uh, like earlier in the summer, and I really struggled with it. I was trying to read, I think, like Red Rising, The Bone Hunters, and I can't remember what the third book was. I think like a some kind of, I think it maybe it was like a like a Norse sagas or something like that. So I was trying to do all these different, and then I think I was doing another audio book. I can't remember. And it started out good because I had a routine down mm -hmm. where I was reading Lawson in the morning, uh, audio book when I was moving around, and ebook while I was eating meals and <laughs> I had a whole system and then I traveled and it all like all I wanted to do was read the bone hunters <laughs> so then I and then I had to like take a break from the bone hunters because oh no I have a buddy read coming up at the end of the month I need to like get ready for that so I had to like take a break from that and jump into another book and go head first into that book to be ready for a buddy read so it ended up all unraveling and falling apart. <laughs> but I do want to try it again. I, I, I really am envious of people who do that. I know Leslie, who you've also had on Chatting With Nuts before from the Nerdy Narrative. Yep, yep, she yep. reads several books at the same time. And I love watching her weekly videos because she always says, this week I've read. And she looks like 10 different books she's been reading. <laughs> So, yeah, she, she actually is the first person to tell me she's like, you should read multiple books. <laughs> and she was also another person who told me to get into manga. And I've, I, and I've never been an anime or manga guy, but I started this past month. I started with the Vinland Saga and Berserk. And I can tell you that also being able to jump into a manga, like when I'm bored, I find that it then gets me like it keeps that stamina rolling. It, even though it's still reading, it's like totally different. It is. No, you're right. Actually, I just started getting into manga too. And I found that is really helpful for me when reading Malazan because man, Malazan takes up a lot of 
yes. mental energy. You have to really think about what you're reading about um, to an extent. I, I'm not a very analytical reader when I'm reading, but I still feel like I have to concentrate on what's happening. And like, okay, this storyline, oh yeah. Well, you know, because we're jumping around so much. And, uh, but yeah, I started reading manga. I think last month I read, or a couple months ago, I started reading the manga Orange, which is a time travel manga, wraps <laughs> up in, I know, of all things. <laughs> it's actually what I've been interested in for a long time too, but it was fun. And then I just read Uzumaki. And so yeah. for Halloween, so that was fun, but it really does help. And you're right. It is a totally different kind of, it is reading, but it feels different. It sort of like relieves your brain somehow. Yeah. I, and I'll be honest with you. Like I'm loving it. Like I love those two. I berserk. I've only read the first three. It's like the first three issues and they're all one edition. I loved it. I love the cliffhanger ending. It gave me, I've been, I'm only reading manga on the weekends oh. because it was starting to take away from my book time a little bit. Like I was like, I kind of want to keep reading this. Um, I do enjoy books more just because of the format. Um, but like manga is here to stay with me. I think I, I I'm really enjoying it. Um, and you're right. It kind of, it kind of refreshes you a little bit and then you jump back to your book and it's totally different. And uh, it, it's really made me be able to read more. It just has. I might to try that near. I, I've heard so many good things about Berserk. So maybe based on what you're saying here, maybe I'll pick up Berserk. I might even do a review for Berserk. I, I got to do a review this weekend. I don't know what I'm doing yet. It's either Berserk, Vinland Saga, or I, I got a couple books to review too. So uh, it'll be one of these things. But the thing that I like about multiple books being read at once, and you do have to kind of pick and choose which ones you want to do. So they're different, I think. And Liana's library said this in a comment, and I can't agree more. It's a perfect way to put it. It's like mood reading, but you're still sticking to your TBR. So you're like, I have like, here's a list of 10 books I want to read. You know, I'm going to read these in the next few months. And it's like, ah, you know, today I don't feel like reading the bone hunters. I'd rather do some. Oh, here's good omens. And then you just take good mm -hmm. omens off, off the rack. And it's like, so you're still sticking to a TBR while still getting that feeling of like the mood read endorphin rush. I might try it again. I might try it again. So um, one thing that I found for me is that one of the reasons I think I struggle with uh, reading more than one book at once is that, and this was just for my one little experiment, but I still want to try again, is that I am a very slow reader. I feel, and I don't just, I know a lot of people say that, but I really am a slow reader. I think I need to do a test and find out if I'm like reading word for word, you know what I mean? Instead mm -hmm. of kind of reading in patterns or how people are supposed to read. I don't know. I don't know if I ever just never learned how to read right <laughs> or what it is. I know my motor skills in general are very slow, except for running. I can run really fast. But other than that, my motor skills are just like, like typing. I'm a very slow, clunky typer. I can't play piano very well. Are you rotten at ping pong? I've never played ping pong pong. I should try it out. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, Alan says he's a slow reader. I feel like I'm a really slow reader though. And so what I found was when I was trying to read multiple books at once, it was harder for me because reading one book at a time, I, it felt like it built more momentum for me mm -hmm. because I'm so slow, if that makes sense. So I felt like I was making more progress when I was reading one book at a time. Yes, Whereas yes. when I was reading multiple books, because I'm such a slow reader, it's like, wow, I'm barely inching through so many books. So my momentum felt like lower. So my motivation would kind of droop. Yes. And it just felt like, oh, no, I'm not getting anywhere with my reading. <laughs> yeah, so, I think the, the way I bounce out. So I try to read 100 pages a day. And mm -hmm. for me, it's yeah. like, which yeah. is a lot. It's a ton. Um, and I'm like, OK, so right now, right. Prince of Nothing is my primary read. So like minimum, like. 75 page like 50 at a very minimum right yeah. and for me what was happening because i agree with you it's like okay if i get the audiobook and i have the a reading copy right either ebook or physical um i can plow through this faster if i just focus on it but what was happening was i was hitting my daily goal i felt like reading still but i just i was a little burnt out on whatever story i was reading yeah. and yeah. that is where i really enjoy either jumping into a manga or jumping into a different book. And I will say that I think that multiple book reading is better suited for standalones because last month I read 10 books 
And I think six of them were standalones and being able to jump between standalones much easier than getting in and out of dense fantasy series without a doubt. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to experiment with this again. Um, I actually was up to reading a hundred pages a day last year before I started my channel. Honestly, starting a channel took up a lot of time. It <laughs> sure does. Yeah. I was surprised, that. Yeah, I was sure surprised how much that it actually ate into my reading time as ironic as that. Um, immersion reading helps me. A lot of people do read immersion reading. I, I am, read yeah. I'm doing immersion reading for, um, Malaz and I have to, um, mm -hmm. Which Angela, um, booktubing friend, uh, said this, and I agree. She said some sentences Erickson writes you have to hear out loud because they're so good, yeah. and I think that's that's one of the reasons why I like the immersive read. But also for maintaining and retaining knowledge from those books, I have to do the immersive reads. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's so helpful to do that for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and I know, like, but that's a, but the thing about immersion reading. Cause like, I know uh, Jake is saying there that it helps him. I'm a slow reader, only reading physical. It's true that maybe I'm a little faster reading Im immersion reading than I am just physically reading. However, I still read slowly, even when immersion reading, <laughs> depending on the book. So um, yeah, it just depends on the book too. Yeah. I read so much because I sacrifice a lot of time. Not because I read fast. Yeah, that's what I tell people. I, I, I would not say I'm a slow reader, but I'm not a, I mean, I know some people who can get a hundred pages an hour. I'm not that person. Oh, I, yeah. I'm yeah. good on, on a bad day, probably 30 pages an hour on a really good day. I would say maximum, like max 50 to 60. Mm -hmm. So maybe the average is like 40, 45. So that's how I look. I'm like, okay, two and a half hours of my day to get a hundred pages. Yeah. Like, and, and right and now it, I can do that. So, and it can depend on the book too, right? Because like, I, I know with Malazan book of the fallen mass market paperback, 50 pages is different than That's trade nice. paperback uh, 50 pages. You know what I do? I go off the Kindle on Amazon and I see oh. how many pages that is. And then I will do the division or the multiplication to figure it out. <laughs> wow. I'm very methodical. Like I, I, I I don't mess around. Like I, I have a system and I like sticking to systems. Cause uh, I know when I was reading memories of ice, I read the trade paperback of no, no, sorry. The mass market paperback. I checked it out from my library at the time of memories of ice. Mm -hmm. And I was doing 50 pages a day. And, and I, man, like with the trade paperback, it's amazing if I can get through 50 pages of Malazan in a day for me. Personally. Yeah. Well, so I'm looking at the the Bone Hunters and it's like 890 pages or 790 pages, I think, something like that. The text is so small. I'm like, I'm not reading this book in seven days. It's going to be two you, days. I bet you're going to go fast through that, though, because the Bone Hunters, man. That I've is heard it's crazy. crazy. I've heard it's wild. Amazing. In my, in my opinion, I have a hard time. I know Philip said this, too, on your channel the other night, and I feel the same way. I don't know how to rank the books. I'm the same way. Like, I can't rank these books it's just too hard but i do think that the bone hunters out of all the books for me i felt like the pacing was the fastest in the bone hunters just incredibly fast paced throughout and never felt slow for a second for me that's awesome i mean that that's yeah. really good to hear um because i've been reading a lot of and not that i mind but i've been reading slower books like i would say dune messiah was a slower book even though it was super short uh, mm -hmm. Prince of Nothing is very methodical. Again, that's a that's a thing. I like I like slow books. I do too. Yeah. I tell people all the time I say I love boring books, man. Uh, <laughs> Alan and uh, Patrick of reading through Dagger and the Coin, and they both were like, you know, that first book. Yeah, you know, actually, I don't think Alan did so much, but I remember Patrick was like, I was DNF book one. He's like a slow start, but man, it's and now he's sold, right? He's like, you just got to get through that first yeah. book, and I'm like. I love book one from the get. Like I love yeah. it. And I don't know. You, I feel like I guess it's slow. changed for me this last year. Cause like at the beginning of the year, I was reading the Lord of the Rings. I was doing my reread of the Lord of the Rings to finish it. Cause I never had actually finished the whole entire uh, Lord of the Rings. And it was funny because I joined in with Alan's read along of the red rising series. Mm -hmm. And so I, and it was interesting because I read The Fellowship of the Ring 
And then I read Golden Sun. And I know everybody loves Golden Sun, that second book in the Red Rising series. And it's a, it's a good book. Objectively, it's a good book. However, man, I, my mind was still in Tolkien land. I wanted to be in this slow, steady pace. And then so jumping into breakneck speed, it felt so jarring for me. It and is jarring. I had the hardest time adjusting to that book. Hardest time. Yeah, me and, and you I, actually started our Tolkien. Because didn't you start last year? Is that right? No, I started this year. Yeah. Maybe I commented on one of your videos because I started a Tolkien reread last November and I did the two towers and I stopped at the two towers because I heard Andy Circus was going to do the audio books. And I was like, I want to hear and I want to hear Schmeagle. So uh, so I need to actually finish the reread. I started last year. I got to do Return of the King in December this year. So I did I did immersion reading for the Lord of the Rings for the two towers and the Return of the King. I just physically read the first one. And there is an audio an audio book that's free on audible and at the name of the podcast is the unexpected journey and it is like a full like what's the word kind of it's action. yes it is amazing jimmy yes it is amazing and the guy who does smeagol or to yeah who does uh Gollum is just he sounds just like the guy in the movie the the well, guy it who might does, be it might be. Yeah. And then the guy who does the um, the ends is just it's ridiculous how good the voices are amazing. And there's like the musical score is the same as the movie. So it's the sound effects, everything. It actually it got to me. So oh, I got so emotional. So I highly recommend it. It's free too. it's free. And Man. you can also speed it up if you want to on Audible. So yeah, not Audible. I'm sorry, Spotify. It's on Spotify for free. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So well, I'm in. Yeah. You got to check it out. I'll send you a link. It is okay. brilliant. It is brilliant. They do, I think they do The Hobbit as well on there, but I only did, like I said, The Two Towers and Return of the King. Yeah, I, I want to do The Hobbit after I do Return of the King. Um, and then I would like to read the Cimmerillion and there's also just a ton of other Tolkien stuff I need to get into. So I'm, I'm hoping to sprinkle in more Tolkien this coming year. I also have the Alan Lee illustrated editions and those are big, those are big things are hard to hold, but they're very nice for an immersive read because you get the illustrations and you can take a second while the audiobook's still going, you know, it's just, it's, it's a really, and it always reminds me of winter. I don't know why. I don't even know if the movies were released in winter because the movies are really what got me in back when I was a kid. Right. Um, I do remember getting the Lord of the Rings omnibus back when I was a kid after the movies. And I remember that being near Christmas. It might even been a Christmas gift, like an early one. And, uh, for some reason, Lord of the Rings is my Christmas time stuff. Like I always go back to Tolkien. Oh, that's perfect though. That's a beautiful, oh man, maybe I need to start doing that because after finishing it this year, I'm like, man, I, that is, a, that is something that's worth rereading several times. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah another uh christmas read is the duncan egg short stories by george i love them i love duncan egg so much i love it just as much or more than the main series and we're doing those in the song of ice and fire read along and i can't wait till we get to those because i think people sleep on how much they are in those little short stories like they're way more approachable but there's still a lot of stuff when it comes to the histories and little subtle tie-ins and nods to things and that's just another Christmas read. It's like a comfort oh, read. Oh, I love that. I love the idea of reading something comforting and warm at that time of year because I hate the winter. <laughs> so anything I could do Same. to make me feel kind of like more uplifted at that time of year is always a good thing. Yeah, I am actually the same. I am not a fan of winter. I'm also not a fan of snow. None of it. No. Um, eventually, I will move to the West Coast. It will. What happen. part of the country do you live in? Um, I live in the DC area. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So yep. that must get cold there then. Yeah, it does. But uh, I used to live in the Appalachia. So it was way worse there. I, bet. Um, like I, moved, <laughs> I moved like three hours here. The climate is so much different. So much less snow, so much less ice. You know, it, it's oh. so if I was going to be anywhere on the East Coast, this is where I would be. So, yeah, that's wonderful. I'm I'm originally from the Southwest. So I'm, I love, I'm a desert rat basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love the Southwest. I'd love to move to Arizona. That's where I would yeah. like to go. I lived there for five years. Yeah. It was great. 
Yeah, I love movie. Phoenix. Uh, the whole the whole shebang. I'd move there in a heartbeat right now. Yeah. And they have great bookstores there too. Great used bookstores there. Uh, Changing Hands and Bookman's and yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I uh, I would definitely move there or Nevada. Um, there's something about the desert that also gets me into a reading mood, which is weird because I actually don't like books that take place in deserts, even though I like Dune. You like Dune though? Yeah. I love Dune. Yeah, no, <laughs> I love Dune. Um, Andrew says he uh, had to dip out a minute, just finished Wrath, so he just wrapped up The Faithful and the Fallen. Oh, uh, I haven't read any John Gwynn yet, but oh I know man, need to read. Yeah, do yourself a favor, go read The Faithful and the Fallen, especially as a Tolkien fan. Um, it is it is very derivative of old amazing tropes, very David Gemmel inspired. And let me tell you what, uh, the faithful and the fallen is a gut punch, but it's also like there's so much hope and bravery in those and and like camaraderie. Uh, the yeah. best, yeah, the absolute best man. I was awesome. laughing earlier because I saw in the chat that like Alan put read LPQ, and it's funny because every episode of Chatting with Nuts I've ever seen, I think I've seen Alan put it in the chat read LPQ. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Al Alan is, you know, I, I love Daniel Abraham. I've pushed the dagger in the coin, but it's nothing to the level of what Alan's done for the long price quartet. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But, uh, but, but going back to Gwen, I, I actually have a copy of shadow of the gods. Have you read that one yet? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like all of Gwen's works. I still think the uh, faithful and the fallen. So shadow of the gods, I think is his best book one. Um, we got to see where this it goes. Cause it's not, like we yeah, don't have any idea, yeah. right? Yeah. But the faithful and the fallen is just so fantasy. Like it is fantasy, but it's still fresh in a lot of ways. Uh, and I know there's some people, you know, like it got really popular. So like, there's always going to be like that, a negative wave after a huge positive, like it, cause more people read it, varying opinions. But for me and my dollar, hard to beat John Gwen. Like, I really want to read it. I, well, I own it. So it was a gift from the bookish mom earlier this year for my birthday. So I definitely want to pick that one up. That's probably going to be my first win book. And then maybe just to, based on how I feel about it, then I'll probably maybe pick up the Faithful and the Fallen series. I have heard various opinions about it, but um, yeah. overall, yeah. pretty positive for the most part. I think you'll really like it uh, just based on what you enjoy. If you're a Tolkien fan, I think you'll like it. Uh, yeah. It just feels like classical fantasy with that modern fresh take. And I love it. Also, no one writes, no one writes better combat uh, hand to hand, sword to sword than, than John Gwen. That's what I hear. Yeah. I hear he's fantastic at that. So he's the best, very, yeah. the, the absolute best. Um, and Scott said, there's room for me in Arizona. Thank you. Scott is the uncrowned King of Phoenix. Yay. Uh, oh, I miss Arizona. I loved living in Tucson. It was so wonderful. <laughs> Those trails where it's the sunsets, just absolutely gorgeous. Andrew, Andrew says Gwen is so good. He's such a bastard. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because John Gwen will break your heart. Yeah. He will absolutely break your heart. Let me come back on Jimmy so I can say it live. <laughs> Alan, you're always, Alan's been too busy for me recently. I don't know why. You see, Shadow of Gods is getting yeah. a lot of praise. Wow. Philip says his favorite yeah. Gwen book so far. Yeah. I yeah, say, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love seeing yeah. it. Also, I helps that John Gwynn's a great guy. Yeah, I, I definitely will be getting into Gwynn next year. I'm really excited though to read The Shadow of the Gods, that's high priority. Are you into Norse inspired stuff? I I want to be. <laughs> I did. Um, I, I start, I read, <laughs> I, I don't know a lot about Norse mythology. I did read the Saga of the Volsungs earlier this year. So that was kind of my introduction into Norse mythology. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. And so I, I want to learn more for sure. There's, there's a lot to learn there. And I, yeah, I'm subscribed to a channel that's like totally dedicated to Norse mythology. And I've enjoyed some of the videos I've seen of that. Um, and of course, Philip Chase is a huge Norse mythology expert. So <laughs> definitely interested in that, especially knowing its influence on fantasy. And I just feel like I would, I just feel like I would appreciate more fantasy if I got into more Norse mythology. I'll, you know, it's a great series for Norse stuff is the yeah. Vinland sagas manga. Oh yeah. 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 I'm telling you it is. It, I mean, it's, it's historical fiction is what it is. Yeah. I mean, um, and I'm also going to read the Saxon stories by Bernard Cornwall at some point um, for sure. After I read his warlord chronicles. That's oh, I want to. Oh yes. Is that the one with winter King? 
Yes. Yeah. First one. I got yeah. the trilogy back there. And Sarah Reed's read it. She and was Alan. a huge fan. Alan read it. I mean, I know I'm going to love it. And I know Gwen basically modeled his battle scenes fr from Cornwell. And people say, mm -hmm. um, you know, George R. R. Martin's even said, like, no one writes combat better than Cornwell. So I'm going to be into it. I'm actually, so this is going to sound weird. I'm not the biggest combat fan. I talk about it a lot, yeah. Yeah. but it's like romance. When yeah. it's when it's not clicking with me, I want it to be over so fast in a book. Yeah. But when it is done well, I marvel at it. Yeah. Well, you know, oh, you you got um I just saw that Philip Chase said Jimmy is selling me on Vinland Saga. That'd be really cool that if you got uh, Philip well, Chase. Well, we were supposed to we, we talked about <laughs> reading it together, but see, I I'm a bad friend and I just dove in to Vinland Saga. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and Philip's really really busy. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't have a life. So I was like, well, let's just do, <laughs> let's see what's going on with this. Mind. And I did tell him, I said, Hey man, you're going to love it. Like I, I did the test run. You're in the clear. I don't know. I mean, Philip read Dune in two days. So I was impressed with that. <laughs> oh, um, God, but yeah, awesome. that would be cool. If, by the way, Philip, if you picked up some manga and Finland saga, maybe I'll pick that one up too. It sounds really cool. And uh, so, so. I'm the same way though, Jimmy, I, I'm not really, mm, I'm not really all excited about battle scenes when I read them most of the time. I really love Tolkien's battle scenes because I feel like they're very atmospheric. Like there's like a whole, I don't know, like they're very immersive and they feel very atmospheric. Yes, so yes. If, a, if a writer is able to do that, then I'm really into it. I also really enjoyed Martin's battle scenes and A Song of Ice and Fire. But yeah, for the yeah. most part, yeah, I'm not usually a big fan. And it's interesting, too, because I feel like in battle, everything's chaotic and very fast. But the thing, the, the kind of funny or ironic thing about that is that when reading about battle scenes, I feel like I'm forced to kind of slow down to try to take in what's happening because yeah. it's so chaotic and people are trying to be so descriptive of everything. So there is an art to writing good battle. It doesn't make you feel like you have to slow down so much to kind of get it all. Yeah, totally agree. I think also um, sometimes battles and fights can be very formulaic depending on where they are in a book, right? Like there's a lot of times where we know that this is a scuffle that is going to lead in the good guys getting just away because it's a little hope spot, right? Or something, um, which is fine because like those are pieces. That's how you tell a story. They're, like there are devices in which you tell your story. Um, but there's some people who don't waste a single moment in battle. And I think Gwen is one of those people also shouts out to everybody. giving my boy make Gwen some love in the chat. Mike, Michael was saying characters are great. Make Gwen is top, uh, top five all time. Shandell's agreeing. Andrew says he's the goat. Uh, make Gwen's one of my favorite characters of all time in all fantasy. Yes. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. Uh, also Nor Norse mythology by game. is something I'm definitely going oh, to read. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Me too. And I've heard the audiobook for that, by the way, is also amazing. And I love anything game. And I mean, after reading The Ocean at the End of the Lane via audio, I'm all I'm sold on any. I just bought that book. I just bought that book. That'll oh. be my. So Good Omens is my first exposure to game. And mm -hmm. then Ocean at the End of the Lane will be my first game and book ever. So The Ocean at the End of the Lane is the audiobook that made me a believer in audiobooks because it's That's narrated awesome. by game and himself. And at the time, I didn't know about digital databases and stuff. I listened to it on CD in my car. And I found I just wanted to drive everywhere because <laughs> it was so good. It was yeah. so good. I, it's one of those audiobooks that I feel like convinced. I, I love it more on audio I, than I would if I had read it with my eyes. But I love that story. It's fantastic. That's definitely worth rereading too. I would definitely reread that one. And it's a short one. So that it's helps. Short one, yeah. I'm going to try to squeeze it in this month. If I can, I'm going to try squeezing it at the end. Uh, Cause yeah. I got, I'm going back home. So I got six hours in a car. So that may be, maybe that's an audio book I can do. Oh yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Pat says, is Vinland Saga one of those really long mangas like one piece or is it short and contained? So yeah. Vinland Saga is definitely not as long as one piece, <laughs> um, but I think there's like 11 or 13 editions in each each book contains two at uh, two releases, two issues. Uh, so, it, I mean, it's not short, but it's not like insanely long, Pat. That's and doable can, for manga. Yeah, yeah, very doable. And I think it's scheduled. And I and if I'm wrong, tell me, guys, I, I'm new to this. But I think from what I read, it's supposed to end in the next couple years. Um, 
like there is a planned end of arc. It's like a thousand page or I don't, I don't want to talk out of turn. I'm not sure, but maybe I think the date I saw was like 2023. So you could read it now and get caught up and be with the releases, which I think is an exciting thing. Um, and you can read them digitally. Uh, that's one thing I read some of that. I read one while I was waiting on the physical, like I had the little sample and I did it digitally way better. Way wow. better. You can. So I'm an idiot and didn't know how to read manga, right? Like I'm trying to figure out how to read the other way. And on the, on the yeah. digital, you can just hit the next button and it slides to the panel. So what? like it takes all oh, the thinking out of it. I love that. Someone's probably listening. I, I hate that. You know, <laughs> I'm sure yes. there's a manga fan out there that is throwing stuff at their keyboard or at their screen right now. But um, I loved it. I thought it was great. So I will check my library and see if they have in Moon Saga because I would love to read that. And I, yeah, I, I definitely want to get into more Norse mythology. Um, I want to read, I know American Gods, there's a big buddy read going on for that with the Brothers Gwyn and with Abby Salter this month for a shelf space. I really want to get it. I, I wish I had time. <laughs> I have dust of dreams on my TBR. So I feel like that's going to take a while. Now wrap up Malazan. Just wrap it up. Get it done. <laughs> you know, know what I mean? I know I have to just take my eyes away from all the shiny objects of all the buddy reads and all the things going on. But yeah, I, I really would love to get into that. Yes, I want to read War Warlord. Yes, that's very high on my list too. Of, uh, For sure. Yeah, I think Warlord is in my top five TBR right now. Um, yeah. Like after I get through the things I have this month. Um, Prince of Nothing was like the last thing that I dedicated for this year. Um, I wanted to get into Richard K. Morgan, but that's just going to have to wait a little bit. But Shelf Center says Neil Gaiman should read all the things. North mythology is great. Shelf Center, good to see you. I saw you talking about Malazan earlier. Um, love, love hearing you talk Malazan, man. Glad to yes. see you, man. Yeah. Yeah, people love Neil Gaiman as a narrator. He's amazing. He really, yeah. really is. Yes. He all right. Yeah. Ian uh, says the Vinland uh, hardcovers look so good too. marketing for manga destroys books, by the way. Like I can't get matching book sets, but there's like 85 million editions of like a manga and they all match and they're all amazing. Are, are you copying me? What, what is this? <laughs> I like never wear my glasses on a uh, video, but I'm just going to have to because my eyes are getting like tired. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, actually, no, the real truth is I want to copy you. Well, I don't blame you. Uh, I don't blame you at all. Uh, I do. I do bring the dark room glasses up to a whole nother level, um, and I support. You. I really do. Just need to have the muscles now. So. <laughs> uh, Scott says, "I think I'd have to do manga on audio. I'm too old and stubborn to read a book backwards." <laughs> Scott, digitally, you don't even have to worry about it, bro. You just hit the next panel, and it goes. Um, mm. And you know, I. I'm afraid people are going to be like, oh, Jimmy's only going to talk about manga now. That's not it. It's just like it's new. So I'm really pumped up about it. You know, whenever you get something new, you're 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 wanting to read. Well, and go. you're reading two very popular ones right now because I've heard fantastic things about Berserk and Vinland Saga has been very popular. I've heard great things about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is Yay, that mine. is anime <laughs> yeah so and I don't know where I'll be with manga after I read these two I may never find another one I like I don't know um I'm up yeah. for I'm up for whatever I'm definitely gonna read attack on Titan as well because I actually watched that show and I think I'd rather read it to be honest with you um but I don't know I'm just a big fan of storytelling like do you feel that because you have read some of these big, epic, amazing stories with a great characterization, all these things, do you find yourself appreciating tropes and mechanisms in other mediums that get across the story? Like, for instance, like movies. Like, I feel like I watch movies different now. That's a really good question. And honestly, I don't watch a lot of movies anymore. It was sort of like an exception for me to watch Dune and I watched The Green Knight earlier this year. I did too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it, in a way, because I think like with those two movies in particular, like let's just talk about Dune. Like I uh, like something that I was appreciating about that. I know that people are always talking about in books how about uh, showing rather than telling. You know what I mean? Yes. Like in books rather than having a lot of exposition sort of, you know, or saying he was angry or she was sad to kind of show little subtle clues of things that are happening or have subtext. And I think it's helped me appreciate in movies when you can see communication come across visually rather than through dialogue. So 
that's something that I've come to appreciate. I feel like a lot of movie directors, I don't know if I'm imagining, I mean, because just on the tiny sample I've like watched recently with the Doom movie, I thought they did a great job with actors did a fantastic job just showing a lot of subtlety with their acting to kind of convey certain emotions and certain things happening without a lot of dialogue. And I really like that. I do too. And it's funny because uh, I've seen a couple of movies this year, but I'm with you. Like the two that stick out to me are The Green Knight, which a lot of people love and a lot of people hate. That's a very diverse movie. I loved it. <laughs> I, I loved it as well. I think it's yeah. very nebulous and ambiguous, but I thought that the it was almost a silent movie. Like that's how yeah. little dialogue there is in that. And yeah. I thought Dune, I said this to my wife, and maybe this is a really dumb thing to say, but I'm all about saying stupid stuff on live stream. So I felt like watching Dune in the green night felt like reading a book. Yes. D yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I got, the, I got the same pickups on subtle nods and facial features that, that in a book, when you catch a sentence and you go, mm, there's something there. Yes. I feel the same way. Yeah. You know what? I think you're right, Jimmy. Cause that's how I felt too. Watching those. I felt like I was more attentive to, to, to certain details because in, when you're reading, especially the reading, the kind of books that we've been reading, you know, like Moss yeah. and Colin, or even like what you're reading with Baker, it, it, it trains you to sort of look at certain little things and pick up on certain nuances. Oh, Erickson definitely does. I mean, Erickson, you know, and people get mad when people say this type of thing and they think it's like some sort of like gatekeep or elitist thing. I'm not saying it like this, folks. I'm not. I have become a better reader since reading Malazan. Yes. I, re I really have. And that doesn't mean that you have to love it or, or if you don't like it, that you're not a good reader. I'm not saying that. I'm saying one of the benefits that I've gotten out of reading it and reading something that's done in a little bit of a different style is that I can appreciate a lot more subtlety um, than I used to be able to. And I just think that it's maybe more experienced. And because of that, I feel like I read a little bit differently now. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even the person, you know, some people say they read Malaza ruins all books for everything. And that's I, that's not me. That is not me. That'll never be me. Um, because I can appreciate all types of different characterization and storytelling. Uh, but what it has done is definitely opened my mind to how a story can be told. What can what can you use in a character uh, to make them unique and to make them memorable? Um, th these are all things that Malazan and I would say Baker um, has done extraordinarily well. And I felt that way when I went and saw Dune. And I saw a lot of people say that they didn't love Dune. or I, I mean, it's obviously overwhelmingly positive. But there are some people say, I went watch. I have no idea what happened. And that's totally valid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but my problem is when people say no one could understand a movie unless you read the book. That's not true. My wife went watch. I didn't say a word to her after the movie. I'm kind of talking to her and seeing what she picked up and what she did. She, she understood the whole thing. Yeah. You know, and I don't, you know, and kudos to her. And I'm not saying if you didn't, that you didn't pay attention. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying that it's there. Like you yeah. can understand it without seeing the book. So when I see people asking for more exposition and all this stuff, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know. I like that it was uncompromising. Oh, I liked that it didn't go overboard with explaining things, honestly. Yeah, I, I like that it isn't for everyone. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I had some critiques of the movie for sure. Sure, but yeah. Overall, I, I still, I, I appreciated what it did. And the same with The Green Knight. I actually loved it. I loved that. I it loved it. It was a very modern interpretation of what that story was. And mm -hmm. it was so fun. I was actually on in a discussion on Philip's channel discussing that movie. And it was just so fun to kind of I actually of watched that discussion. I really enjoyed that discussion. I, I think that's a film that garners a lot of discussion. It does. But the Green Knight is not for everybody. Yeah. No, it's not for everyone. At and, all. <laughs> but, 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 and back to what you were saying about Malaz and making you a better reader, I can definitely, uh, I can relate to that as well. And I think for me, watching discussions like the ones that you've been having on your channel on Malaz and, and the Malaz community on, on BookTube has made me a better reader too, because it's helped me to kind of look back and reflect on what I read and see it from sort of like a different angle yes. or sort of synthesize a certain uh, certain themes and concepts and things like that in different ways. And so, and there's just no end to it. There's no end to how you can pick apart or relook at those stories. So I feel like in a way it's maybe a better reader in that regard and looking at stories in different, from different angles and different ways, thanks to the community aspect as yes. well as the books themselves. And also I think one thing that I love about this series is like, a, like I was saying with each book, you kind of, it really, 
it behooves you to go into each book expecting something totally different, not expecting, don't yeah. expect every book to be like Gardens of the Moon or, you know, <laughs> The Bone Hunters or uh, Dead House Gates, but just having an open mind because one thing I love about what Erickson does in this series is how the structure of every book is completely unique from the structure of the book before. Yeah, it, they are. They're called tales of the of Malaz in the Book of the Fall, and they really are tales because they each feel different. Yes, and I, I I like that about Malaz and um and yeah, and and I guess what I would say about that, in addition to it being like you said, tales, but also in the fact that the structure is unique for each book, but also like the very nonlinear timeline, the way it jumps around in time. Um, I think all of those things, all of those aspects. For me, and just understanding also how he's taking a very kind of like deconstructivist, I guess, postmodern approach, if that's the right terminology, mm -hmm. to this series has made me more interested as a reader in being more open minded to different types of narrative, to being open minded yes, yes. to different types of story. Yes. Um, which I think is kind of, you know, exciting because it's like, wow, I can open my mind to a different, to something totally different than I would have ever thought I could be open to before. Yeah, I think it opened up, uh, opened me up a bit. And I think that's why I like Hyperion so much because Erickson mm -hmm. does that short story type of tempo a lot of the times in his books with his parts, especially Gardens of the Moon. Um, and Hyperion obviously is a collection of short stories that happen to be tied to a larger narrative. And I love Hyperion, but there's a lot of people who read that. And, and that's fine. Like if it's not your bag, it's not your bag. But I do think that um, Malazan in some ways made me appreciate Hyperion more because of that um i left this on the screen because scott said i missed a lot of the stream jimmy did you successfully convince johanna to join us reading Janie warts next year i actually haven't mentioned Janie warts but when people talk about uh challenging series that are robust and have the deepest of lore uh you know you're starting to see war of light and shadow come up quite a bit and Janie warts is gaining some steam uh in the reading community especially online um there's a ton of people you know, that embrace her and say that it is a challenging read. Uh, the War and Light and Shadow. I'm actually going to do the uh, Empire trilogy with both Raymond Feist first. And then I'm going to jump into her uh, 11 book series next wow. year. Yeah, I'm oh going to jump goodness. right in. So I want to read Jenny Wirtz as well. I've been, I, I didn't even know about this author. Honestly, I think AP Canavan is the first person I saw talk about it. Jenny, Jenny Wirtz. And, yes, that's right. Me too. Um, and then I saw a fantastic review of her standalone book over on Counselor of Moonspawn, who's a Malaz tuber on her channel. And I, I think I want to read her standalone first. I cannot remember the name. Somebody in the chat can mention she it. She actually even recommends that to people. And, and maybe oh. I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that too. Yeah. Well, if you do, let me know. Maybe we can buddy read it and talk now that, about it. Now that would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then I can have you on my channel. I'd love to have you on my channel. Sometime. Oh, anytime. Absolutely. Yeah. I would I would love to come in and discuss that. Air of the uh, Air of the Empire, whatever it's called, the Empire Trilogy with Raymond Feist. The reason why I want to read it is because Patrick specifically told me that like, he was like, dude, like you're going to love this. Like this is your bag. A hundred percent. You have to read this. And the thing about me and Patrick, um, we have pretty similar taste. I don't think that we're your a hundred percent match. Um, like yeah. I used to think, but the thing about Patrick is Patrick is so good at identifying what people will like, yeah. like based on your personal taste, if you know him. So I might not love every book that Patrick loves, but if Patrick tells me I'm going to love a book, he's been a hundred percent right every single time. Wow. He's like, so talented at that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of it is that he's a good guy and he listens and, and Patrick's been a good friend. I, I was friends with Patrick before I started booktube. No way. Yeah. Um, I, I messaged him and I was just like, dude, you're the goat. And uh, we started talking <laughs> and uh, yeah, I talked to Patrick months before I ever had a booktube channel and uh, he's, he's remained one of my good friends for a long time. So um, I love Patrick, but he told me that the, uh, that specifically that trilogy is going to be a massive hit with me. So I'm pretty excited. He's also, he actually told me when I was starting Milan's and he's like, I I'm going to be honest. He's like, I don't think it's as hard as people make it out to be. You'll be fine. Cause I was like, eh, am I dumb? Like, am I too dumb for Milan's? <laughs> and he was one of the people that really, uh, you know, along with like the Andy Smiths and Phillips and APs and Rhythma, um, they, those people helped a tremendous amount, especially Rhythma's Gardens of the Moon yeah. review. Well, Such I feel like I'm too dumb for Milan's, but <laughs> eh. I don't think you are at all. I no. Yeah. 
Uh, We're well, both plenty smart. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We have glasses. But, yeah. <laughs> it's true. We look like siblings, kind of. Yeah. Movie. Someone said you look like uh, Clark Kent's sister. So <laughs> I think that I think that's fair. There you go. Yeah. Now, the new Doom film cut out the dinner scene. Yeah. And I'm still salty about it. Imagine if they made Gardens of the Moon film to cut the dinner scene from that. So mm. I actually said in my review, I'd be mad if they cut it out. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm mad. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, oh. it's, it, I'm, not, I'm not that bummed. I think the dinner scene is amazing as a literary device of like getting like, first off, the thing that makes the dinner scene so interesting is the perspective choice that Herbert uses of that omniscient third person when you're getting in each person's head as they're having this very political maneuver and conversation. Yeah. I don't know if on screen it would hold any sort of impact to, to hold up to what is in the text. I just don't know if it would be, I think it'd be a cool scene, you know, stabbing it, take what's mine, whatever. That's cool. However, I think that scene is iconic because it's good writing. So yeah. I don't know. And, and when I say good writing, I don't just mean like the words on the page. I mean, literally the perspective choice plays into that and all this other stuff. So I'm going to let it slide. I'm going to let it slide. That they didn't do it. And I also heard there's a five hour cut of Dune and your boy will be watching all five hours of that. There's a five hour cut of Dune. I had no idea. They cut out a lot. Apparently there's an entire section of the movie. First off, the beginning of the movie, like with um, I don't know, the Freeman, the beginning of the movie, it's like yeah. five minutes tops. Apparently it was supposed to be like 25, 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah. And there's also footage of Momoa like dropping out of the atmosphere and landing in the Freeman, like before they go to Arrakis oh. and stuff. And wow. like they have it all. It's one. It's a one shot of him falling like out of an airplane or something. Yeah, I, I mean we're we're book fans. We have to watch the five hour footage. <laughs> in? Are you kidding? I'm yeah. in. It's gonna yeah. be amazing. Yeah, that that dinner. I was disappointed about the dinner scene. There were a lot of things, honestly, in the book that are like my favorite parts in the book that weren't in the movie, and I'm understanding about it because of what you have to cut out in order to make. A movie successful and that some things just don't translate probably as well into a movie as they do in a, in a book but it was a little disappointing <laughs> yeah i mean i i think as far as like an adaptation they did a damn good job but yes. yeah and you know what um the millionaire saying you know that could have been a good chance to shove acts because and you're 100 correct i think it would have been awesome for different reasons how about that um yeah and people are asking if petrick is the fantasy whisperer you're, you're damn right he is that's Damn amazing right. that he's able to be so attuned to people's reading tastes. It's a good dude. He listens when you talk. And yeah. that's something, uh, I don't know. That's something in the book community I've noticed, though. I feel like when, when I talk, people actually listen. It's it's horrifying. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think that's a really interesting thing about Petrick, too, is that he he seems to be just really attuned to sort of the majority of readers. Like, you know what I mean? Like his taste on my on online individually with any one person, but he sort of, sort of has a sense of what's going to be successful across a broad audience. And I don't know, that's pretty impressive, but that's neat that you were talking to him before uh, you started your channel. So that yeah. was, that was obviously I, before he started his channel. Too. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So, so uh, I mean, I'm sure he had other people helping him out, but I definitely was one of the first people uh, to tell him he needed a booktube channel and i think i showed him how to uh showed him how to do a couple things and i helped him get his channel up and again i'm not saying I, i'm not taking like responsibility for patrick's channel but you know I, I did help him out with it and i taught him how to remove backgrounds for thumbnails that was fun oh, well, that's <laughs> which, cool. which yeah. is as simple as just going to remove dot bg that that's all i told him to do and he's like this is super easy i'm like yeah dude i'm i'm not doing anything special here i promise <laughs> that's um, cool yeah, Patrick's been like one of those people in the book community that like obviously it started about books, but like I I consider him a friend. Mm. Um, uh, I I don't talk to him as much as I want to because we live in different time zones, so it makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but you know, I talk I talk to Christian every day. What a good dude! Uh, Christian is uh, the gentleman from Lost in Discovery. He made Cosmere videos and such. Oh, um, cool. And uh, it, it, it's amazing. You you start talking to people about books and, you know, did you read a song of ice and fire? And then you end up talking about your days and uh, yes. it's cool. Yeah. Very cool. There's, there's a good amount of people that uh, really do listen and uh, they're good friends, really good friends. That's so cool the way that works. And I love, um, yeah, I feel like I've made a lot of good friends, you know, through this community and it's just neat to make friends through books because I know when I was 
uh, before I discovered booktube, I always wanted to talk about books. Like I, I remember just for years thinking like I just, even on my social media, kind of wanting to talk about books, but then think, but then looking around and knowing a lot of people I know read voraciously, but they never talk about books. And I always thought, is it bad? Am I book bragging if I talk about books? So I kind of like that in this community, it's just fine to talk about books. And you don't have to worry is, about that. <laughs> is that what pushed you to get in front of the camera? Like what, what um, made you pull the trigger on a booktube channel? Okay. So I don't know if you know this about me, but my channel started off as kind of a joke. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, kind of. So what happened for me was I, well, I'll, I'll give you, uh, aw, thank you, Alan. Uh, and Alan, that's like a meaningful that Alan just showed up right there in the chat because he's actually the person I, I credit for starting my channel. Um, really? I, yeah. Yeah. It's really, I really thank Alan because I, I mean, I was getting, I did get into booktube a couple of years ago. And when I discovered booktube, um, I mean, I did discover fantasy booktube was kind of how I got in. But it seemed like all the channels, for whatever reason, the algorithm worked in such a way for me that all I really saw was YA fantasy channels or YA fantasy channels. Well, YA is the biggest thing on BookTube for sure. It's got to be. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah. So I wasn't finding very many adult fantasy channels. So that was how I got back into reading fantasy again was I, I started reading a lot of YA. And then, of course, from there, things like Sanderson and the Poppy War and Little by Little, the First Law and that kind of thing. But then one day, uh, Jesse May actually she shouted out Alan's channel. And as soon as I found Alan's channel, I was just hooked. I, I went, I, I don't usually do this when I find channels, but I went back and I, I probably watched all of his videos <laughs> at the time. Um, I, I don't think he had a channel for that long at the time, but I just thought, who is this guy? He's so funny. He's so entertaining. And I have to admit, uh, it did I hope this won't offend Alan, but I got excited that he was a little bit older because <laughs> a lot of, you know, the YA booktubers were a bit younger. So uh, that kind of was encouraging to me. And I never, at the time, I was more of a lurker on booktube. I would watch a lot of videos, but I'd never really comment. And I got up the courage one day, I think, to comment on one of Alan's videos or follow him on Instagram. And he was so friendly back. He was so, so friendly back. And I just, I felt so encouraged by that. I just, I don't know. It felt, it felt just so exciting to me to make a connection with somebody who was a little more my age in the community and uh, who's into, you know, adult fantasy and who was just a teacher and all the things that Alan is. Alan is just wonderful. I just love Alan's channel. I just love his personality. I think he's a wonderful person and friend. So <laughs> This yeah. is actually Alan's podcast. I just, I, I keep it warm for him and he comes in every like three weeks and yeah. just takes over. Well, he's wonderful. I just he love is. Alan so much. So he, so he was a big part of that. And around the same time, I actually found Philip Chase's channel too. And I found those two channels kind of independent of one another. I think they found each other around the same time too, possibly. Um, but anyway, and it was kind of a similar story with Philip's channel where I watched his origins of fantasy video and I was so inspired by what he said in that video because it related to a lot of research I had done in a different area. And so I left a very long winded comment <laughs> that I didn't expect any response to honestly, but you know how Philip is. He will respond to every comment he receives in his comment section yep. and he responds in a very thoughtful way. And I was just very touched by that. I knew it wasn't like Juana's special kind of comment, but just the fact that he takes the time to do that for people meant that I, I knew that this was somebody who was a sincere, really kind person. And so that's what I look for in booktubers, by the way, uh, as a viewer, because I was an obsessive booktube viewer. I was like, I love people who are like Alan and Philip, who are authentic and who are passionate and who are good human beings. So that really spoke to me. And then, so after a while, Alan was like, <laughs> Alan was basically saying, you know, join, uh, encouraging his viewers to join Discord, basically. So I got involved in the Discord community because of Alan. Uh, I started commenting on more videos, thanks to Alan and probably Philip too. And then uh, by the end of the year, I 
suddenly I, you know, I was interacting with all these booktubers and I finally looked. And then one day I looked at my YouTube channel and I saw I had like two subscribers or three subscribers and I didn't have any videos. And so I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I'm like, ha I have like three subscribers. And, I, <laughs> and so I made a joke on one of the discords. I, I made a joke. I said, if I get to five subscribers, I'll do a Q&A video. And so I, right away, I got like six subscribers. And, so, <laughs> and I didn't think I would do it. I was just kidding. But I went ahead and did it. I said, okay, I'll take questions. So I offered up, you know, let me know some questions in the Discord. And I got a few questions. So my very first video, you can still see it on my channel. It's pretty bad. Well, all my videos or whatever. But um, I, I put out my very first video was a Q&A video. And uh, I, I got some encouragement after that. So I decided to keep going. <laughs> So that's how I started my channel. And so I started at the very beginning of this year. And oh, thank you so much, Francois. I, uh, I do love to leave thoughtful comments. I, I do my best. <laughs> I know that they, they mean a lot to me when people leave thoughtful comments. And so, yeah. So that's basically how I got involved in the community and how I started my channel. And I have to admit, too, that even though I did start it as a joke, just watching insightful discussions discussions that I started to see emerge on the channel like this, like what we're doing really got me excited to want to jump in the screen and talk to people. So, yeah, that's awesome. I think, um, it's probably not talked about enough of like what a lot of the medium and large creators do other than just make content and that is create communities and also give people motivation to do things. Right. Um, like to be honest with you, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Daniel Green. Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, he's the biggest, biggest dude really on the platform, I think, or, you know, one of them. And uh, as you get more and more popular, things change, channel changes, people have differing opinions or whatever it might be. Right. But I can say point blank, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that he made a channel back in the day because you're right. There wasn't a ton of adult booktubers. Right. There's like there was Murphy. There um, was Elliot. Mike's book reviews, Daniel Green, like these are all people um, specifically like Mike and DG were two people that I watched in, and they motivated me um, to, to make a channel and, you know, going on and, and your taste change and, and you go in and out and, and, and whatnot. But uh, it's that initial step that that's really important. And I think that Alan is and, and Philip and AP uh, like those three are so different, but they also bring in different crowds. Um, so that's why we're seeing different type of people step up to the plate and, and create content. And it's, it's really exciting because you get different opinions on books that you love. And I think it's just really incredible. Um, and you're right. The comments, that's a big thing. I respond to almost every single comment I get. And when I can, if I see it, sometimes YouTube screws me over and doesn't show me. Um, but I do that because, and Philip says this, he said, I'm here for the discourse. I'm here for the conversation. Like I didn't join booktube to yell at you and then got log off. Like I'm here for the conversation. So he enjoys commenting back and I do too. That's the thing. It is hard because now I, I always get over it's somewhere between hundred to 200 comments a video and it, it does get difficult. And um, I totally understand that. Like I totally understand people like Daniel green who can't respond to every comment or Murphy Napier. That's totally understandable. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And, uh, but I think like this is one of the thing about book two that, that makes it different than the other little places on uh, YouTube is that our community is one of the very few communities where it does seem that the creators are very interactive with their audience. If you go to other niches on YouTube, it, there is very much a, um, me and then mm -hmm. you, Yes. Maybe you get a heart on a comment. Maybe you get into a discord that they're not even in. Right. Or something like that. Oh, or, you know, you might get a, some sort of interaction. I think booktube is much more of a community than these other niches. I'm sure there's other ones on YouTube, but I'm thinking about the big ones, you know, video games, movie reviews, comic books, other things like make makeup. That's a huge thing. I guess uh, people love, um, but our community is different because I feel like as creators, we want to interact with our audiences because we want to hear people's thoughts. Um, and when we don't, uh, we don't make videos about that stuff. Usually like 
That's yeah. just, you know, we're making videos because we want to interact. So it is special. I think that's why what makes BookTube special is the interaction, is the community, and is the, the conversation and the dialogue that happens. And we just happen to be in that small niche where there is an open highway of communication between the creator and the commenter. I mean, I have, I have people who have been subbed to my channel for such a long time. When I was just talking about Faith on the Fallen, screaming with a man bun into the camera, uh, people like Stuart, who is like, oh, yeah, I mean, he's been here for a long, long time. Um, and they, they become friends in a lot of ways. And, and I know, you know, Stuart's taste in books. We don't even agree on everything. <laughs> we don't agree on everything. Uh, but it's cool to know his taste, know what he likes, know what I, you know, know what he's going to recommend for me and what I can recommend for him. And it, it's just really cool. It, yeah. It's cool, man. Uh, I think it's something special and I'm really glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that Alan motivated you to, to get on the platform. I didn't know about Alan until really a little bit before I had him on the first time on the podcast. I think it was like a couple months and oh, really? Alan did not motivate me to get on book two, but he sure as hell has motivated me to get off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, Alan is maybe want to be better mm. because if you go look at Alan and his channel, uh, one, he should have a hundred thousand subscribers. I know, I totally he has thousands and he's doing very, very well. And he'll continue to grow because Alan has a great community and he's a great human being and he's so entertaining. But yeah. If you go look at Alan's Discord and you go look at Alan's Patreon, he has a very dedicated community. And I think that speaks volumes about who Alan is. Yeah. Uh, and and he is a he is a good model for for what you can do with a channel um, and, and be an individual and be entertaining while still providing good content. You know, I think a lot of people uh, they want to entertain. Maybe they want to lean into more of the YouTube aspect of what we do. And I think that's awesome. Go for it. Mm -hmm. um, especially skits like man caring thing is phenomenal. I love mm -hmm. his skits. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes when people lean into the entertainment uh, and, and really, I'm not even speaking of anyone I know. Um, this is more I've seen in other realms and other niches that I, that I enjoy, like history and stuff on YouTube. And I'll see a YouTuber and they, they're trying to be entertaining and they lose the spirit of what they were doing. Yeah. Alan has never lost the spirit. You Alan know, is the spirit. <laughs> yes. And I totally agree with everything you're saying. And I think, uh, Alan, we're just gushing about you. I can't, I can't help it. Um, but you know, it's, it's the thing about Alan is like, he, I'm talking about him as though he's not here. Alan, the thing is like, he, although he is very entertaining, his reviews are very high quality. Oh, like, yeah. And we don't even agree on some like I hate The Well of Ascension. I think it's a terrible book. But Alan, <laughs> ma Alan made me realize I said, you know what? I got to give it up. The well, siege in that book was excellent. Yeah. And it was kind of the opposite for me because I loved The Rage of Dragons and he hated it. And I he, like The Rage of Dragons, too. Don't worry. He's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I still love it. I'm not saying that Alan made me hate it, but the way he critiqued it. I had watched and I knew a lot of people. I knew when I read the book, it was divisive. I knew a mm. lot of very big channels did not like that book. A lot of channels did, but I knew some big channels I followed did not like that book. And I watched their critiques and I couldn't disagree with them, but Alan's critique of it, he picked on some things that nobody else picked up on. Like I was really impressed. So yeah, he has some excellent critiques of things and his Malazan critiques. He only has three Malazan reviews on his channel now. I've been trying to get him to put his Malazan. He's going to be coming on for our Malaz. He's going to be on for Midnight Tides. I oh, believe. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Yes. yeah, because he has some amazing insights. So it's amazing because he is incredibly entertaining and incredibly funny. But it's not It's not just that. Like He really does have amazing insights to back that up too. Yeah, he absolutely does. And, and he he brings up uh, different things that I wouldn't think of. And I know he's really big into sieges. He's into like mm -hmm. economic yeah. stuff. And I like that a lot. Also, shout out to Shad. Shad's been here for a long time. He was he was <laughs> watching my Daniel Abraham reviews when nobody this is before Alan got on a soapbox. Nobody was reading Daniel Abraham unless it was the expanse. So shout out to Shad. Oh, for nice. being one of the three people that watched that dagger in the coin review back in the day. <laughs> yeah. So have you read on in that series? Have you? Uh... The da so the dagger and the coin, I've read all of it. That's oh. it's phenomenal. Uh, I, you want to talk about getting a matching set of books? It took me a year to oh, find wow. matching. Oh, it was a m miserable. Uh, so long price quartet, 
um, I'm probably going to do an ebook because I don't even want to deal with yeah, it. Um, but I need to read more Abraham. It's kind of funny. Alan's actually reading the dagger and the coin. I need to get the long price quartet so we can be rounded out for his new release. That's coming out. Um, yeah. Eric is asking what's Alan's channel. Uh, he is the library of Alan Zandria. Mm -hmm. um, he has been a guest here on episode eight. 8, 11, and 14, I think. Uh, you can check it out here on the channel, and then uh, you can also uh, search that here on YouTube as well. My mom enjoys Alan, so that's always good. <laughs> oh, yay. Hello. She's always here. love that your mother joins the chat. Yeah. <laughs> She's always here. Um, my mother, um, people were commenting on my comments earlier, which is very flattering. Somebody asked me about that once, like... Uh, I guess because I talked about how I was one, one in one video I talked about how I was an app I was an avid journaler for years and years. I have like journals filled from cover to cover because <laughs> I'm just crazy that way. And uh, somebody asked if that was why I left good comments, but honestly, it's my mom because my mom. It's so funny if people think I leave good thoughtful comments. My mom, she doesn't watch my videos very often. She'll usually like batch watch them weeks later. And then she'll text me these amazing, long, eloquent paragraphs, just t discussing all these like thoughts about my videos and what I had to say. And it's just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I love, I love mothers. <laughs> yeah. I got my sense of humor from my mom for sure. Nice. Yeah. Uh, a shelf center said Alan's one who makes me want to quit trying to book too, but I have to remind myself that I can be myself and don't have to be as awesome as this channel because that's not possible. So <laughs> I actually relate to this quite a bit because, uh, you know, one of my best friends in life is lost in discovery. And, uh, if you guys have watched lost discoveries, Cosmere videos, I think he is like, I think he's one of the best on YouTube. Like, I think he does such a good job. He has such a good voice. His editing is top notch. Like he was on, he was on his way to being like the alt shift X of Cosmere, in my opinion. Um, and I think a lot of people have tried to emulate what he's done and I don't think anyone's done it as well as him. And I don't know if they ever will. Uh, and I would watch his videos and get really bummed out because like, I'm not that good of an editor, but I had to remind myself that like, you know, this is to be honest with you guys, like my reviews, I love doing them, but this is my thing. Yeah, like, this is my thing. Yeah. And other people will have long form podcasts before and after me. I didn't create podcasting, but no one does it quite like me. Um, so you just got to run with who you are and You're what you are. You're so man. good at this. You are so good at this. Absolutely. I appreciate it. I mean, yeah. it's something I, I genuinely work on um, because as it is just a general conversation, like, mm -hmm. and I try to keep it really chill. Um, I want, you know, we, we've had over 50 people this entire time. Um, every one of the episodes over a thousand people watch. And that is incredible to me. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I take that responsibility, like pretty damn serious. Like I am very much a person that wants to do things at its best. Like if I can't do something 100%, I don't do it. And, uh, this is something I, you know, the new camera, i got this audio, like I went really hard into this because I wanted to provide like a really good quality experience and I'm still working at conversation and interviewing and, and segueing and stuff because I want this to be enjoyable for people. And I, and I, if, if so many people, if 50 people are on a Friday night going to sit here for two or three hours with me and my guest, uh, I, they deserve the highest quality. So, um, I not, I'm not really the best thing I can say shelf center is like, don't even worry about what other people are doing, man. Yeah. You know? um, I remember in wrestling, uh, you know, a lot of times you see guys make it to like WWE and you're like, I was better than that guy. Like I, I, I should have made it. But William Regal said something to me. It was at one of my WWE tryouts. And he was like, all the time you spend thinking about like why that other person's better than you is time you could have spent just getting better at the things that you do. And, uh, you know, we each have a spot and we each have a role. And it would be like, you know, the WWE would sign like a bodybuilder guy that was like 350 pounds, could barely move. And uh, guys around me would be like, that was my spot, man. Like he stole that spot. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, you're 180 pounds and you do acrobatics. It's not the same spot. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's room yeah. for everybody, man. You just have to make your own spot. Um, and for what it's worth, Shelf, I think I think your stuff's excellent, man. I love how I love your uh, genuine enthusiasm, but that goes to anybody. And I, and I tell myself this stuff all the time too, cause I watch Alan's, you know, or, or I'll watch other people's stuff and I'll just be like, man, I'm not as good. As, I'm not as good as that. Um, but at the end yeah. of the day, I remember how much I get out of this and all the people who do tune into the videos and I comment back and forth with, and yeah, you know, it's just, it's something different. It, it's, it's a lot more personable than uh, numbers on a view counter or subscribers on a button. 
It's yeah, a lot, you know, it's a lot more than that. So it's really interesting. I can kind of I can relate to this too, shelf centered, because I know that when I first started my channel and I was recording myself and watching my videos, I was thinking, and then I'd look at, and then I'd watch Alan's videos, and I think, oh my goodness, I have like no personality. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the thought I had, and you know, I mean, you can't like compare yourself, of course, but it is. It, I can understand that. I'm just saying, I can understand that sort of mode of thinking or that sort of like rabbit hole of thinking and something Alan and I talked about I had him on my channel a few weeks ago and we had one of these kinds of discussions just kind of a casual yeah, it was like three hours yeah it was a three hour discussion. I popped in for a while yeah we did. thank you um yeah and it was interesting too because I think we briefly talked about how channel growth there's almost like a blessing in a way of not growing too fast and sort of Finding, taking your time to find your voice because it does take your time to find your voice, I think, as a booktuber. So kind of like what you were saying, like maybe that 310 pound acrobatic person isn't your niche or whatever, that maybe sometimes it takes a little time to figure out exactly what your niche is or what, uh, like you said, you, you found that you love chatting with nuts. This is your thing. I mean, did you know that? I mean, maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't know that right away. But maybe, you know, somebody could come into this and it'll take a while to figure out what their thing is. Or um, they might want to go, you know, not necessarily make the same exact kind of content and, or do something a little different. I know for me, I mean, these are my favorite types of videos to participate in our discussion videos. It's definitely my favorite thing to do on BookTube. Uh, but I think it's been a process, even just doing reviews yeah, yeah. or anything. It's taken some time to kind of, oh, this is my voice as a booktuber and it's still evolving. It's still, you know, something to figure out over time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, uh, there's a couple of points I want to touch on. Go um, for it. So, so one, thank you, everyone. I saw kind things being said. I'm glad you're here uh, for sure. Um, yeah, and someone said it's not a competition. Just do what you do. That is correct. And Alex, Alex is, or Alan is fantastic. Um so there's a couple things. One, I totally agree with you on channel growth. I'm sitting at, I think I'm going to hit 4,200 subs this week. And I'm like, when is enough enough? Like, I'm so happy with what I have. Like, I love my audience and I love what, like the people that talk to me every day and show up to these. And even when we disagree, it's a blast. And like the Patreon uh, discord, like we have a very small group in there. You know, I think there's 40 people in there, but you know what? Like, it's, it's actually transcended books. It's like, you know, people talking about their work days and stuff. And I, I, I if it gets too big, I'll, 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 I'll lose some of that. Right. So there, you're right. There is a sweet spot. Um, and I don't know what the ceiling is for, um, you know, a past his prime meathead talking about books. Like, I don't know what my, what my ceiling is. I imagine it's somewhere around like 7,500. Um, but I just don't necessarily care all that much. Uh, about those things um and, and it is a bit of a blessing to be in a, a smaller size uh channel because i get to have actual interactions with people and i remember what they say on comments um and, and i think that's really special and for anyone who's like watching this and you've been thinking about maybe writing that blog post or you've been thinking about making those reviews or maybe you want to do something totally different you know i have a patron and a, a subscriber's name's rj and he created a channel um and oh, I, should, yeah, I like RJ's channel. RJ is great. And RJ said, you know, I'm going to start a booktube channel and I'm going to, I'm just going to do dramatic readings of my favorite scenes and books and put some art behind them. And, and that's what I want to do. And he's going to do reviews and stuff, but you know, he's like, that's what I really want to do. And he did it. And I think he's doing an excellent job. And, yes. you know, and if you worry about, do I have the right equipment? Do I know the right things to say? Like you just have to, you know, a shallow buff will say, just do it, just do it. And you can't be afraid to fail. Yeah. If there's one thing, I, I am not a spectacular um, talent at anything in my life. Um, I've always been pretty medium at most things or, or average to below average, I would say. The one thing I was ever really good at naturally was pro wrestling. I was very good at fake fighting. That was my jam, right? <laughs> um, but even then, to start that was very intimidating, right? There's a high chance of failure whenever you do something like that. Um, but you just really got to be willing to fail. And I've noticed um, in this community, I see a lot of people who have really great insights. There's a, um, a gentleman in Alex Nevaeus' Discord named Pranav. He's in a lot of Discords, but that's where I talk to him most. And Pranav is like very articulate, very bright guy. 
and uh, he should start a booktube channel. Really I've should. been telling him that too. Yes. You're now, talking he, about he, the one who has the best Malazan. Yes. Now, he, he's oh. going to get canceled because his Song of Ice and Fire opinions are garbage. <laughs> garbage. But that's okay. You know, I still love him. Um, but, you know, and I think about people like that and I'm like, man, I hope he got, I hope he does it. You know, I, I hope he uh, does it. So if, if you're uh, listening or you're watching this or whatever you're doing and you think that you might have a unique take or you just want to get out there and put yourself out there, just do it. Just do it. Because I'll tell you what, like, you know, how many live streams I did before chatting with nuts that had like five people, a couple, you know, I mean, like, but I, I had a good time and I kept doing it. So you just got to be willing to jump in um, and, and make that leap. So. You know, it's, it's fascinating because I, you know, like I said, I started my channel kind of as a joke, but honestly, I think part of me, I mean, if I'm really honest with myself, there was a part of me that wanted to jump in the screen and was just terrified. And I was terrified, of course, and I still get anxious to this day on some of my content. But the thing is the idea of just talking to the void as a mini channel starts did you start that way, Jenny, by the way? Did you start talking to the void or did you? Um... I, I So my first channel, all right, so here's basically if if I'm shooting straight with you, yes. I watched everyone on booktube and I said, I can do this better. That was, <laughs> I said, and, and I didn't mean that in like, I'm better yeah. than these people. But I said, mm -hmm. I said, I can bring something to this because I have talked in front of audiences most of my adult life. And I mm -hmm. felt like my comfort, my, the, how comfortable I am in front of a microphone or in front of a camera would then translate very well. Mm, okay. And I'm a meathead. And I'm like, maybe I can tell other meatheads it's cool to read. Um, yeah, so, so I don't mean that it, it sounded bad, but no. it's not so much like I can do this better than everybody else. I should say that I felt like I could reach a different audience um, and that if, if other people could do it, I could do it. And I wanted to do it. So I did it. Uh, but it, I started off my channel just screaming about why people should still be reading A Song of Ice and Fire. If you watch my first video, I was like cutting for a jujitsu competition. My face is sunken in. I'm on pre-workout and I'm like, season eight sucked. Who cares? Like, it's, it's, really, it's really bad. It's actually a terrible video. Um, and then my second, my second video, I did a review of game of Thrones and I was trying to be Mr. Like I'm really hard critique. And uh, I gave it four out of five stars, which is stupid because it's a five star book, but I was comparing it to a storm of swords. Like I was trying to like, you know what I mean? Like, you're nervous. People are going to think you're being easy on books or something, you know? So I went from a person that was trying to be extraordinarily uh, critical and fair and balanced to this is my experience with this book. This is what it offers. And here's my su supremely subjective experience. And uh, I just came to realize it didn't matter about how many golden acorns I gave. I had a thing. I used to give books acorns out of five. So four <laughs> acorns out of five. And if you were really good, you get a golden acorn award and then that qualified you for my year end awards oh wow Holy sounds shit. fun right yeah but you know what it didn't fit me it just didn't mm -hmm. fit me so that's how i got started i was just i was just trying shit i was just trying stuff out you know yeah but did you have like i mean uh, did you have subscribers right away or were you talking to the boy huh, oh oh okay I apologize. <laughs> I went on a huge tangent. I had a hundred subscribers already from wrestling. So as soon as I posted a book video, a bunch, and this is like a dormant wrestling channel, um, a bunch of people unsubbed. So yeah, I was basically talking to the, I was talking to wrestling fans and half of them were probably here for the tights. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I think it really, it, it, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know that I could have done a video to start out with if I didn't know I had at least a few people who would watch it because uh, I made a lot of friends through the discords and things like that. Yes, yeah, I didn't join anything like that until mm -hmm. like uh, about maybe a year ago. Yeah. yeah. See, I, see I, I have so much like admiration of people who could do that, who could just talk to the void because that would be the hardest thing to do. I tried to do that and this is kind of something I've never talked about before. But I did always, I, well, I know this kind of sounds weird, but I did want to start a YouTube channel for years. In fact, I used to always get on people I'd know. I'd say, you should start a YouTube channel. You should start a YouTube channel. Not necessarily books, but I just tell everybody I know. You'd be so fun to watch in a vlog. But I think it was because I secretly wanted to be on YouTube or something. I don't know. But I, I did try to start a channel. It was not a book channel uh, like a 10 years ago. 
And it was going to be totally different. It was going to be like on healy, kind of healy feely topics, <laughs> like self compassion. And I don't know. I'm kind of into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and self efficacy, which is what I was studying at the time, which by the way is kind of what you're talking about, but I'll get into that in a minute. But I, uh, I did. I tried to do that. I, I posted one video and I posted it to my Facebook page and I got like no views or no comments. And finally, I just took it down. I just couldn't handle it. I could not handle like it just being out there. I, I don't know. It was scary. I think it's really scary to start just talking to the void. So I really am. A, and I'm in huge admiration of anybody who starts that way. I think that when you're really passionate about something, it changes the game and the stakes a bit. So I love books. But if someone tells me my book opinion sucks, I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't really care. Mm -hmm. So with wrestling, I was very different. Um, very, very concerned with what was being posted. Um, and, and wrestling is also theatrics, right? So people are watching this right now. Uh, and if people saw me cutting a promo five years ago, right, for a wrestling match that I'm hyping up out of context, that is, it's not, it's not what something I, I would want. That does not appease me at all. Because when you take that kind of content out of that world and it's just on, it's just on YouTube or it's on whatever TV or something, it, it's like, it's very vulnerable. Yeah. Um, it would be like someone seeing your audition tapes as an actor. You'd be very yeah. embarrassed by that. Mm -hmm. because it looks silly because it's not in the context of that entertainment realm. Yes. So I felt that what you're feeling uh, about wrestling promos, you know, I, I remember I would be at a party or something and someone would be like, Oh, he's a wrestler. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And the next thing, you know, someone has their phone out and they're showing like a promo and you're yelling at the camera and it just, it, it's very, I didn't like it. I never liked that. Um, I didn't actually, this is the most I talk about being a wrestler uh, on here. Because I don't think anyone really cares. I, <laughs> Wait, which, I think it's like? interesting, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's something, right? It's it's something to talk about, I guess. But like um, back back when I did it, you know, I I never, you know, very separate, very separate. Mm -hmm. So, but it's led a lot to who you are. Like your, it sounds like it's uh, built a lot of your motivational philosophy. I owe all of my success in my life to my journey in wrestling. Yeah, um, it's a business I fell out of love with but without a doubt changed me forever and has given me, and also just, I think the way I came up, um, I, I just, you know, there's a lot of times in my life. I felt like I was just trying to survive. So that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, grew up with wrestling from Portland, Oregon, rip Oliver, uh, Jimmy snuck of that group. Yeah. And, um, um, Piper, who I was friends with Roddy Piper was also from uh, Oregon, Portland. He did uh, cable TV up there back in the day. I remember I had a Jimmy S for us. Yeah. Don't watch it. Uh, yeah. See, that's the stuff. Like I don't really care for people watch. I know I have them on my channel. So like, I guess it's there, but like, I feel awkward people watching stuff out of context, you know, I don't know, but I can understand. Yeah. So, so, so self-efficacy, mm -hmm. what in the world is that? Yeah, that was actually my dissertation topic. Uh, yeah, so self-efficacy is a person's belief in their ability to succeed in a task. So your self-efficacy, it's different than like your self-esteem and your self-concept because you can feel really confident. Like, oh, I'm super confident wrestling this person, right? Mm -hmm. In these circumstances. But uh, my self-efficacy, so maybe your self-efficacy is really high for doing a wrestling match, but it's really, really low for, mm, for flying a plane. <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing. So it's really dependent on the task. So it's your, it's your belief in your ability to succeed in a task. And it's informed by four different things. And one of them, and this is kind of sound familiar to you probably, but one is mastery experience. So mastery experience is how many times you've done something. So even though maybe you had never done a booktube channel before or a YouTube channel before, like you said, you had so much experience talking to a crowd, talking to people, uh, getting up in front of people and talking to the camera. So you actually had a lot of mastery experience, at least in that area, that made it a little bit easier to build your self-efficacy for starting a channel. And then another part of self-efficacy 
is uh, dependent on verbal feedback, so verbal or verbal persuasion. So maybe you have a bunch, you haven't started a channel yet, but you have a lot of wrestling friends who say, hey man, the way you talk about books, it really works. You, you, you're actually convincing me to want to pick up some books. So you're getting like, I think you would be good at this. So enough people tell you this, then it's going to build your self-efficacy. And yeah. that is a little weaker than your mastery experience. Okay. So mastery experience is number one. That's going to be the most important thing. So of course, the more videos you do, the more, the better your self-efficacy is going to be. It's like, yeah, I've done a bunch of reviews before. I know I could do a review again, but the verbal persuasion part is going to be dependent on how much you trust those people. So if you feel like uh, you don't know what you're talking about, then of course the verbal persuasion isn't going to be as effective. And then another part of uh, the third part of self, another component of self-efficacy is your, uh, mm, let's see, your vicarious experience. So let's say you've watched Daniel Green, a million videos of Daniel Green and Murphy Napier, and you just say, hey, I could do that. Like, I see what they're doing. I could see myself doing that. Or even with wrestling, you watch wrestling over and over again, you're seeing what they're oh, doing. Yeah. And you're imagining yourself in that role, you're putting yourself in that situation. That's vicarious experience. So that also informs how strong strongly you believe in your ability to do a task, or you could look at them and say, I could never do that. So of course that's going to lower your self-efficacy. And then the fourth one is kind of a harder one. It's, it's an interesting one. That's a physiological uh, experience or your physiology, your physiology or something. So that has to do with like, you know, yeah, you might have high self-efficacy in all those three other areas, but can you do a video if you're drunk? Probably not. Or maybe if you have two hours of sleep, that'll affect your self-efficacy or uh, if you're dehydrated, if you're sick. So things that are happening in your body physiologically. So those are the four things that inform your self-efficacy. And so, yeah. And so that's kind of a real, and the thing about self-efficacy research is that that's pretty much the number one predictor of success. So they studied this with people who took math exams and so people who, there could be two people who have studied the subject. One person has a way higher IQ, maybe who knows the subject more thoroughly than the other person, but their self-efficacy for taking a test is super, super low. Whereas the other person, their self-efficacy is super high. And the person with the self-efficacy has, has a higher self-efficacy ends up outperforming the other person, even though other factors should have said otherwise. But the thing with self-efficacy is it's not a fake it till you make it. That doesn't work with it because hmm. you can't really fool your brain into saying that you've had mastery experience if you haven't. And you can't fool yourself into believing verbal persuasion if you don't trust those people. You can't really fool yourself with the physiological stuff and the vicarious experience. So I don't necessarily think the fake it till you make it thing works with self-efficacy, but those four other things can really inform like your belief in your ability to succeed in the task. Basically. That's a, that's actually really interesting because I feel like um, that relays a lot when it comes to uh, writing for me, like I'll read some authors and the vicarious experiences. Oh man, like this motivates me. I want to do something. I could do something like this. And then sometimes I read things like our Scott Baker or Robin Hobb and I go, Oh, I could never do this. Like yeah. I could never be a writer and then I'll read something else. And I'm like, Oh, I could it, it, it like yin and yangs for writing with me like that. I would say that's one thing like in my life, like the one thing I haven't really went for, because when I do something, I go for it is writing. I really want to write a book. Right. Yeah. But do I don't know. I don't know when or if ever I will put all the effort into it. And that's why I, I wrote a short story recently and I had some people read it and it was really cool. But um, it's like one of those things like I wanted to do uh, NaNoWriMo really bad. Mm -hmm. I don't I just don't have the time. Uh, and to be honest with you, out of like the time I have, I, I want to just keep reading and doing this. Um, so I wonder if my self -e efficacy, which, by the way, Erickson's favorite word, efficacy, he loves that word. <laughs> he uses it all the time in Malazan. Oh, now I that I've said it, you're going to realize it. That's interesting. I'll have to pay attention. I can't remember him using it in like in. Oh, he used, 
Yeah, it's his favorite word for okay. sure. One of his favorite words. I think I have seen it before for sure. Though. Yeah, yeah, I might even ask him about it next. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 maybe I just caught on to it because I, you know, I hadn't used that word a ton. But yeah, whenever you're talking about it, I was thinking about how the, like the vicarious experience, um, I think is is something with right, and probably that vicarious experience is also for people watching book too. Mm -hmm. Well, that person read a hundred books. Like I could read a hundred books. Oh yes, that I could do it. Was. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Jake read my short story novella. So when he says it's entertaining, he means it was bad, but he likes me. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I think Jake is very honest, though. So if he didn't like it, I think he would say. <laughs> uh, Sarah says, I love this. I don't feel comfortable recording a podcast of it to all these align. I, I can understand that. There are times, man, like um, when I'm about to go live or, or do a review and I, I'm like, I am not feeling it. And uh, sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, I think what you said about failure, being willing to fail is really important, too, because that that is also going to build your mastery experience, too, is like doing it even if you don't feel like it and then realizing, oh, I was able to do it anyway. That can sort of build on that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So I would say don't try to wait till all those things align because they might not. <laughs> and sometimes you'll actually build your motivation and. Because self-efficacy is a motivation uh, theory. It's a motivational theory. But I think that just kind of doing it anyway sometimes. Um, and I and not to say that I'm against fake it till you make it. I think that can work in certain scenarios. I just don't, you know. Um, I've it, definitely done it. <laughs> yeah. I've had to do it too. Yeah. So I think, uh, but I, I do think, you know, like you said about failure, I think that's an important thing to do. That's a, an important, important thing. Yeah. Uh, Dino says, uh, hi everyone. And I, I now have a new Friday night plan. Well, I'm glad, man. I'm glad. <laughs> you know, how, how many times have you been like, I really just like, you can't get yourself to pick up a book. Like, you know, you want to read and you, uh, you need to read and you just don't pick up the book. You don't pick it up. And then you finally pick it up and you're like, why didn't I start this an hour ago? This is going yeah. so well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the whole forcing oneself to do something anyway, that has been important for me in Same. any task and building any habit. Um, I'm, I'm a big time runner <laughs> and I don't run every day anymore. I run just a few times a week due to like injuries and things like that and getting right. older. But, but I did at one point in my life, I ran like 35 miles a week. Oh, there's more, I don't know. I was running a lot and I was running every day, but the, the fact was I'd wake up and I just get, get up and run. And I wouldn't question it. I wouldn't think, do I feel like running? Can I do it? I wouldn't question it. I just do it no matter how I felt, no matter how bad I felt. And almost always I feel better after the run. And so you train yourself, you train yourself to realize that how you feel in the moment doesn't really matter. It's you're going to get the reward. You're going to get the reward if you do it. And so it was kind of the same thing with me with reading because I went through a long period of time where I did not read any fantasy or fiction and it's like several years. And I finally just, and I was, I started a book that I wasn't really loving and that was hard too. It's the worst. Oh, it was so hard. And so what I did was I forced myself into the habit of, I will read every day for five minutes a day minimum. And that's it. I have to, like, I have to. I will not allow myself to go a day without reading at least five minutes, no matter how tired I am. And I got through the book. So it's like doing just a little bit of something, forcing yourself to just do it anyway, like you're going to get a reward eventually. So I don't know. I'm really big about just doing things anyway, or at, at least I, I know I still need to follow that wisdom too with a lot I, of things. I, I do as well. I do as yeah. well. There's, there's a lot of times wherever I'll open up a book and I'm like, I, I don't got it today. Yeah. And then I start reading. And then most of the time I get into it. Most of the time I get into it. Um, I, I Maybe more so uh, when we're talking about this stuff, I, I think it more so applies to like physical activities for me. Because mm -hmm. um, like, I don't think necessarily like you have to read, right? Um, no. But, but for me, like fitness wise, like jujitsu and stuff, there's many times I start a jujitsu class and I go, I would much rather be home right now. Yeah. Um, and I always say that you'll regret not going, but you'll never regret going. Yeah. So, um, which I don't know. I got really hurt the other day. So maybe, 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 that, maybe that's not yeah. true. Right. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> when you get older, that. things start, you get a little more uh, bargaining room with yourself when you get a little older. Right. It's yeah. like, <laughs> like, it is what it is. The body yeah. ain't agreeing. I can't do it. 
there, there, there are definitely limits to that for sure. For, for me, sure. I had to do that with reading because I was so out of the habit and I, um, I just couldn't keep up the momentum. I, I'm I, really somebody who relies on momentum for a lot of things, I guess. I'm and, the same way. Yeah. And so with reading that actually built up the momentum for me, just doing five minutes a day, it felt so rewarding. And I was kind of keeping like a little like, <laughs> yay, psychological advice. I love psychology. I was keeping kind of like a habit tracker and just checking every day. And I'm like, oh, wow, this month I read every single day, you know, and that in itself was rewarding. And oh, wow, I finished a book. And then before I knew it, I started building up my reading habit. And so that's how I really got into reading again. So now I feel like I don't feel like my day is complete. It's almost like going a day without brushing my teeth now. It's like I, I my day doesn't feel like yeah. yeah. If You're I don't read at least a page, you know, just something yeah. like building that habit. Um, star says, I know every time I get depressed, it kills my reading. When I realize I've stopped reading, it's a now a warning sign to check in. If I'm dipping into depression, oh, I, so I think I I've had that, but I actually tend to dive deeper into books because I very much am an escapist, um, oh. when it comes to reading. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's, there's a lot of days I don't like myself and I'll be like, oh, let's go get in somebody else's head for a little bit. So yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of the flip of that. Yeah. It's interesting. So things when I started starting is the hardest part. Yeah, that's a lot of things in life. It's definitely true. Cheers it's from Florida. Florida. There's another yeah. Allen in Florida. We got two Allens in Florida. That's true. Just to south of me. <laughs> I'm in Georgia. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, that stuff is so fascinating to me. And uh, man, there was something else I was going to say about the. You know, people read, uh, listen to sad music when they're sad. Yes. I read grimdark when I'm upset. I don't know why. I think like, that makes sense. I think probably what's happening. This is just, I don't know. This is psychologically backed up, but I'm assuming that we're trying to attune to what we're feeling to sort of process it. So uh, it's like meeting ourselves where we are. I like, I like it's the worst thing in the world, in my opinion. Oh, that, yay. Well, I'm glad if I tricked you into having more confidence in yourself. <laughs> I definitely need more confidence in myself, by the way. But, um, but I think that there's something to like, I think it's the worst advice ever for somebody to try to force themselves to be happy if they're sad or, you know, um, just force yourself to let go of anger. Or, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Amazing. Bravo to you. It's anybody who's able to just let go of an unhappy emotion. But sometimes just being in the emotion, not wallowing in it, but just sort of attuning to it to work through it, I think can be a good way to kind of work through something. It's also part of life. Um, yeah. I think it was Robin Hobb who said that life and death are not the opposites of one another, but the, uh, life or the opposite of life is no choice. And that that's the opposite of life. Oh. Like once you stop having the choice. And so you get to make the choice of being in that mood and that's fine. Um, as long as it was a choice, because once you do not have a choice, you have no life. I love that. Well, That's Robin Hobb's the goat. So, yeah, I can't wait to read Robin Hobb. I'm oh. so excited to get into her. Robin Hobb made me a better person. Facts. Yeah. Big facts. I'm definitely starting the Farseer trilogy in January. Yes, there it is. Death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of choice. Okay. Yes. Is the quote. Thanks. J Jake's an insight. <laughs> I know Jake loves Robin Hobb. So. Yeah, he definitely does. It yeah. took the Star Wars, but yeah, sometimes we got to go back to the classics, you know, or, or, you know, personal classics is what I'm saying. Like, I know if I'm in a slump, if I'm really in a slump, like I can go tr crack open Joe Abercrombie. I can go crack open Song of Ice and Fire. Like, honestly, I would say my slump buster, if I had to like pick one ever, would be Dunkin' Egg. It'd be the Night of the Seven Kingdoms collection. Oh. If, I, if I go to that, I'm back. I'm back, baby. Yeah. I mean, Duncan Egg has one of the greatest opening paragraphs of all time. Um, let me see if I can pull it up, actually. Let me, let's see. Because uh, it's Hedge Knight. Open line. I want to see this. Uh, people have written essays about this um, because of how good it is. Um, I got to figure out if I can find it though. Let's see. Here it is. The spring rains had softened the ground. So dunk had no trouble digging the grave. Hmm. 
That's a phenomenal opening sentence. Mm -hmm. I said paragraph. It's really a sentence. Um, the spring rains had softened the ground, so Dunk had no trouble digging the grave. That he is a yeah. season, atmosphere, weather. What is happening? Someone's dead. Why is he dead? I don't know. And Dunk is now our character, is digging a grave. That's wonderful. It's yeah. one of the greatest opening sentences in a book ever. Mm -hmm. Love it. I love so it. So good. That is so good. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a question for you. So you're having Steven Erickson on in a couple of weeks. Um, are you, is that something that you're hoping to continue a trend of on your channel? Like maybe inviting authors on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so th th there's two sides to this. Um, there are a probably only a certain amount. And this is the same thing actually with booktubers. And this is probably a good thing to say. So I get a lot of people like, oh, you should ask cer certain people on and this and that. I, I am not interested in um, trying to get the biggest audience possible every time. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Like I, I only will bring on people I really want to talk to. And I think I can have a good dialect with, and I, I think I can connect with. Right. Yeah. Um, so Steven Erickson is one of those people. Steven Erickson's a genius in my opinion. Yes. Um, I would, it's not one of those things where I want to interview every author or I, I, I say interview, I have a conversation with. Right. Yeah. And it's not because I don't like them or anything like that. But like there are things about Erickson's writing and the interviews that I've seen him in that make me know that me and him are going to have a great conversation, like whether or not it's the best one he's ever had. I don't know. He's been interviewed hundreds of times and stuff. But like I know that I'm going to get something out of that conversation. I hope that he does, too. And I know everyone watching will as well. Um, so I think, yes, I will interview authors. I don't know if it'll be a regular thing like Brian Lee Durfee, someone I really want to get on the channel because I am fascinated with religion. And I think he and I have a lot of the same views on certain things um, and maybe different ones. I, I want to dig in and find out. And I think his books do religion better than most. Any oh, other I books. love religion explored in books too. Oh, then you should read his series. It's very grim, um, but my goodness. Uh, so he's a former Latter-day Saint and he definitely has commentary in his books about religion and it's fascinating it's just oh, fascinating. yes so, this definitely sounds down my alley yeah so it, is that the author of a forgetting Moon? the forgetting moon by uh saga and schuster press i believe is how you say it uh yes and he has a, a booktube channel brian leader his booktube channel is phenomenal um but so that's somebody i really want to talk to but mm -hmm. i have a, see i have a purpose behind that conversation and and i think i could probably become pretty good friends with brian lee durfee if we talked because he's hilarious um i want to talk to robin hobb and I'm going to be reaching out in a way uh, this weekend to her to see what happens. Um, obviously, I'd love to talk to George R. R. Martin, but I don't know. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, you know, and, I'll, and I'd love to talk to John Gwen at some point, too. Uh, John Gwen is somebody uh, I think John Gwen's a very good human being. He um, seems like such a nice guy. He's yeah. a great guy. Great family guy. Um, he's got a lot going on with his new book coming out and stuff. So maybe after his release of his book and stuff, like whenever things calm down for him, maybe we'll have him on um, and I'll talk to him. So I guess the answer is yes. Like I do want to interview authors, but it's not something where I'm like chasing down always the biggest names or anything. It's like people I think I can really have a good conversation with. Same thing with the booktubers. And like, that's why I've had Alan on, you know, three times. That's why I've had Philip on twice and uh, why there will be repeat guests. I'll, you'll come back on. It's because, there's only so many people you can connect with and talk to. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only so many, so much time in a day where I can go and find new channels and new people to talk to. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the best ways I find channels to people who comment on these videos or be, get, if you're in the chat, you know, it's, <laughs> it, like that is a good way of getting on, on, on chatting with nuts with me because you know, if you're adding stuff to dialogue, like Alan, do you know how Alan got on here? Alan was arguing with me in the chat about a song of ice and fire. He said books four and five were terrible. That doesn't surprise me. It sounds like Alan. Well, I'm out. I said, you know what? I said, come on two weeks, Alan. I said, we'll argue. And we brought him on. And then by the end of the stream, he's like, okay, I'm going to reread one day. He's like, that's those sound, those sound great. I don't know what I read. <laughs> I loved all those books. I know I already said that, but I need to reread those two. It's just fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that, that's a prime example, one of, uh, you know, someone being in here, adding to the conversation and he ends up getting on and we have a great time. And Alan's, you know, Alan's the most requested guest still, even though he's been on three times, people just love him to death, um, which I do too. But it's also a good example of people not agreeing and being able to have a conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think it's awesome. Uh Oh, hello, David. David. David said, hello, Joanna. I Sorry I couldn't uh, be on longer, but I did want to make sure to pop in and say hello and Aww, show my support for you. David, we're glad you're here, man. Yeah. 
So um, another follow-up question to you is, yeah. So do you have any like sort of topics you want to bring up with Steven Erickson? I don't want to give spoilers, of course, for your interviews. We don't want to, but well, is so, there any for sort of topics you're interested in talking about? I go, in, I go into these with very minimal questions in mind because I like to see where the conversation mm -hmm. takes. Yeah. And and to be honest with you, like, you know, you, like you, I have a guest, so you're my guest, but also everyone in chat is a guest, right? Yeah, so the, the chat is... <laughs> They should have their own panel up here, right? Well, I guess they get the they get down below, but the chat is an entity and a breathing thing in these, and this is what makes this different. And I think this also is what makes this Erickson uh, conversation different is that most are pre-recorded and things like that. So we're we're going to be able to you know filter in questions. Now, to be fair, I think a lot of it's going to be me and Erickson going back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, RJ, RJ, I plugged your channel earlier. Yes. Man. We were just talking about your awesome yeah. channel. Yeah. Go subscribe to RJ. He's new and he makes good videos. Go subscribe to RJ. Yeah. Um, but I, de I don't want to come in because here's the thing. Erickson's been interviewed hundreds of times. Someone commented on one of my videos uh, yesterday. The house chain said, hey, just so you know, Erickson loves original questions. And that's good to know. But at the same time, like, I can't watch every single and read every single interview he's ever done. I'm going to do my research. I'm going to do my yeah. I'm going to do my job. You know what I mean? I'm going to go and see what he's been asked and maybe draw some questions off of those. But there's also things that are probably really basic, but I just want to know. Um, and if it's not readily available, I'll ask him those things. But really, I just want to see what the mind of an author looks like that's also a fan of the genre. Like, I want to hear what Erickson likes to read. I want to hear what brought him into the fold. I want to hear about, this is number one. If, if there's one question, I'll actually ask him, be like, Mr. Erickson, uh, I want to know what he sees happening in the genre that he finds to be positive and trends that he finds to be detrimental. Yeah. Those are two things that I am very curious about. And I would love for him to articulate why Malazan is a fantasy series and why he did not write a 10 book sci-fi series. Um, those are, those are the questions that I'm begging to ask. And I know he's going to have so many insights and I'm sure there's things that he wants to talk about. Um, so I kind of leave it open, you know, um, yeah. it's kind of where I'm at. He's full of surprises too. I know that just in his, his interview with Brittany from books with Brittany, that was actually the interview that sold me on. I need to continue the series after reading dead house gates. I was just blown away by that interview, but just, I remember in that interview, he would talked about, he said something like certainty is not a virtue, something along those lines. I, I put that quote in my comment because I was just like, that is that that small quote just got me. It just got the wheels of my mind just turning like crazy. Yeah. And yeah. you start to see sort of that theme kind of coming up in the series, too. But also just there was a thread, a uh, sub sorry, Reddit uh, thread in which he was answering questions a couple of weeks ago. Man, he just had some interesting. He's a he has a very interesting mind. So. I have no doubt that's going to be a fantastic discussion. And you have such a fantastic community here that I'm sure that that conversation is just going to bring up so many cool things. I will definitely be there in the chat. I'm so, super excited for that. Yeah, I'm pumped. I mean, I'm excited to obviously talk about Malaz and I think it gives a different scope and a lens over the series when you hear about a creator talk about intent. Um, so maybe it'll motivate more people to read it. But I'm also just excited to like talk to him like a human being, right? Yeah. Um, like hearing him fanboy over something would be neat, right? Like I'm very interested to hear his thoughts on Donaldson and Thomas Covenant. I'm very interested to hear about Glenn Cook. I'm very interested to hear about Robin Hobb. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and how those things all play in, into the genre and maybe even into his inspirations and stuff. So um, if, and also like Malazan is kind of intimidating to a lot of people. So maybe having a casual conversation, um, can kind of bring down that aura just a little bit. Maybe, yeah. You know, yeah. that's going to be fun. Very fun. Uh, when asked if he would give some information about one of the most mysterious characters, he straight up said, no. Awesome. I mean, that's the thing. Erickson's super passionate and he's a genius. So with those two things, uh, you can get some really, really good uh, information from him. But I also feel like he's not going to give up you know, the, the magician, right? Like he's not going to yeah. show you the trick. And I, and I appreciate that a lot in wrestling. We call it kayfabe. And, uh, I respect that quite a bit. I really yeah. do. Um, it, it'll be fun.
which one? Yeah, so, so yeah I want to know which character now. Yeah, which, which character is that, Pranav? Also, I dunked on you earlier for your Song of Ice and Fire paintings, but I did say that you were very articulate and a good reviewer. <laughs> So nice. you can you can rewind to hear me say that your a song of ice and fire takes are hot trash. Ah, uh, Edgewalker. Okay. Edgewalker. Okay. Cool. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not far enough. Wow. <laughs> Well, Joanna, we have done about three hours, and uh, it's went by so fast. Yes. Um, yes, it has. I would like to think before the, your internet dropped, that was like the prologue. <laughs> I'm sorry about that again. I, what happened there? <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. And I, 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 I did say that I would cancel Pranav. Uh, I'll be made if Pranav were to make a channel and to slam a dance of dragons. I'll start doing that YouTube drama thing where I watch his video and talk smack on his review. Like I'll. Do <laughs> It'll be great. We'll have a huge feud. Pranav guest on Chat with Nuts. And not with those opinions. Not with this. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Joanna, thank you so much for coming on. I'm not mm -hmm. going to take up much more of your Friday night. Um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug all your social stuff. Like, where can people find you on the internet? Sure. So I am on Twitter at Joanna Reads, Joanna underscore reads. I'm also on Instagram. On Instagram, it's like my life and book. I never, I, I'm just too lazy to make a separate bookstagram account. So it's <laughs> a mix of everything. But yeah, you can find me there. It's uh, at what resonates. And that's sort of like a play on words because I'm a musician. And so cool. I came from that and a lot of different things. But yeah, at what re resonates um, for now. And uh, let's see. I'm also on Goodreads too. I think I'm just under Joanna under Goodreads, but I do try to post. I think most of that stuff is posted also on my channel too. At, so Joanna channel, Joanna. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the channel is down in the description. I have her tagged and you can also find the link down there. If you're not subscribed to Joanna, you definitely should be, especially if you're a Malaz and I don't know what you're doing if you're not. Um, but she does some wonderful. I'm doing my best to finish the 10 book series this year. Oh, um, that's I a tall order. Yeah. So I just have two more books to go. Uh, so we'll, I'm going to do my best to finish The Cripple God in December. Uh, and I haven't read any of the other stuff in Malaz and World yet, but eventually I'll get to that stuff eventually. And maybe The God is not willing because that sounds super cool. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? The cover is yeah. also sick. I've only heard good things. Yes. yes I've only heard good things. Sure. So. Uh, but you, we'll have you on for some laws and discussion. Um, I might be hitting you up about some midnight tides if you're interested. Very cool. Um, yeah. Going to have a couple different people on for that. Um, but I, I want to thank you for coming on today and uh, giving me all this time on your wonderful Friday evening and, and spending in here with everyone in chat as well. Um, I think that you make wonderful content. I love hearing your opinion. And I learned a lot about self-efficacy, which <laughs> I didn't know was a thing. Yes. until today so thank you for your insight oh thank you so much thank you jimmy and thank you everybody who is watching in the chat it was a lot of fun yeah we had iceland portugal florida everything um you know people were sick i hope you feel better alan i saw someone named alan say they were sick and i, I hope you're uh feeling better uh but this was awesome this was a yeah. good chat and good vibes all around and uh this is like one of my favorite things to do and in two weeks it's 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 basically the super bowl it's, it's, my birth, <laughs> it's my birthday weekend. Oh, it's your birthday weekend in two weeks? In okay. two weeks. Uh, we got NYC in the house, too. Look at this. This is great. In two weeks, my birthday weekend, and I'm chatting with the living legend, Steven Erickson. So make sure you're here in two weeks. If you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Go ahead and hit subscribe. Hit like if you love it. The Patreon's in the description. Optional, but always appreciated. Uh, there is a private Discord that you get invited to. It's a small group in there, but... Uh, I think that they're a pretty awesome group of people. Um, so, Joanna, again, thank you. Chat, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again real, real soon. Until I see you next time, be good, be safe. And remember to always keep turning the page. <laughs>